We are now on the air. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We will call this work session to order. Thank you for being here today. Our public comment is first. Uh, the Board of Commissioners respect our citizens' right to address their government in this meeting, and uh, your comments are valuable to us. Um, you will have three minutes. You will be allowed three minutes to speak, and when you hear the buzzer, uh, your time has ex expired, and I ask that you uh, allow the next person to take the floor. We only have one speaker this morning, and one uh, citizen who has signed up to speak, Mr. John Tomaski. Mr. Tomaski, please come forward, forward, give us your address, and your subject matter is budget process. Good morning, everyone. I'm John Tomasi, 499 Post Road, Winston. I'm speaking about a particular aspect of the budget process um, and uh, preface that when uh, Joel Black, uh, who was the lead auditor of the new auditing company, uh, gave his presentation several weeks ago, there were a couple of things in it that struck my tin ears. And uh, after it was over, I just approached him in the hallway and rather than ask him any of the substantive points. I first asked uh, how many constitutional offices there were, since he had mentioned constitutional offices several times in his presentation. And his answer was, well, something between five and seven. <coughs> so that pretty much cleared up everything for me. I let him know that there were four, and that was pretty much it. And uh, why I raise this at this point is that last year at the budget retreat, every elected <coughs> official, other than the five members of the board of commissioners, was listed as a constitutional <coughs> officer. <coughs> also, subsequently, in a debate here <coughs> at a work session, when the coroner came up as a topic, a couple of veteran members referred to the coroner as a constitutional <coughs> officer. However, the constitutional officer uh, does not include the coroner, <coughs> has not included the coroner since the first constitution of 1777. And it was removed because there were conflicts of jurisdiction between the coroner and the sheriff. Now when we get into the budget process, <laughs> constitutional offices by constitutional mandate are required to perform certain duties and to start certain responsibilities to a certain standard. And if they don't do that, they're in violation of constitutional law. Yet they are entirely dependent initially on uh, getting the resources they need to do their job from the county commission. And there has been a few decades now of case law from the Georgia Supreme Court which dealt with matters where constitutional officers had sued their commissions to get adequate resources. And generally, the Georgia Supreme Court found for the constitutional officers. Mr. Damascus, you finish? Excuse me? The buzzer just went on. I realize that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. We'll take this under advisement and we'll make sure Going forward, we will make sure that we have categorized on the co Constitution officers would be the Superior Court Clerk, Probate uh, Judge, <coughs> Sheriff, and Tax Commissioner. We realize that. And uh, next year, we'll, uh, this particular year, we'll make sure we have it uh, categorized uh, appropriately. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. And Vice just, Chairman. Yeah, just, just to add to your comments, I, I think just for historical context, um, having to retreat for the Constitutional officers, we're going to lose that blanketly. Now, we're not, we won't get into semantics. Um, the board commissioners historically are on the hook for the budget, 
But in times past, and I stood with the prior administration, that like, no, they need to get in the ring, though. They can't hide behind the Board of Commissioners taking all the heat for the budget, and yet they never get an account to the public, right? They get to hide over there on the other side of the fence. And so part of, and I, I agree with the wisdom, was that, okay, look, y'all need to come out here, air out your budget because you are elected. But think about it, they could hide, right? Administration, through Mark, I mean, I mean for the most part, he's the only one that has to be accountable. All right, we got that covered. But for those guys, the whole point was to make sure they could be in front of the public because they're elected and be accountable for those budgets, as opposed to the Board of Commissioners taking all the political heat by themselves. Now, the semantics that, that um, our, our citizens spoke to, Madam Chair, I, I agree with mean, how we properly want to do that. But the whole point was to make sure that everybody who's elected are accountable to the public, especially the press regarding the budget. So that was sort of the, it. It was just sort of to create an atmosphere in which everyone can be it. But I get the politics. I'm going to let that go. We'll, we'll take that up some other day. But the purpose was to adequately got, allow everybody to have a chance, Madam Chair. I think I believe that. Okay. Thank you. Next we have, a, well, we have two presentations. Is Judge McClain here yet? Okay. Well, I'll move to the next presentation. The next presentation is Squast update from uh, Mr. Terry Gable. Chair and members of the board. Good morning. My name is Terry Gable, and I'm with Moore and Alpha Building. I'll be giving the August uh, SWAS update for you uh, today. So uh, this first uh, slide is our, our pie chart, which shows uh, the overall program. It's hundred about 106 million dollar program. 17 percent of it is in parks, as you know. 32 percent is in fire. 52 percent is in transportation, and about five percent of it is in uh, program management for for our fees. Um, July was a, we didn't get any, we didn't put a lot of invoices out on the street, so the, the amount of money spent didn't go up that much in, in July. It's still a little under $10 million is where we're at with overall, overall spending. Uh, this is uh, the Chief Fire and EMS. They were about $4.4 million today. Transportation is about $4 million. And, Obviously, the, the resurfacing is going to be a little bit later in the year, so that'll be the big kick up with transportation for this year. And then parks and rec is still right at 400000 for Gary. Year to date with program management, uh, we're right at about $970,000 total for both years. And then the good news for, uh, for this report is our SPLOS dollars. Our revenues continue to go up so that's a great trend uh, this is a good slide because it, it we're just looking at the baseline that set the projections which is just a little over two million dollars so the last two months we've had have been above that and hopefully it'll continue and continue to rise so good good numbers for the month of June and hopefully we'll see that continue this is just another graphic um, for the revenues in June uh, between April and, and, and June we had about a 300 well, under a three hundred thousand dollar increase in revenues, so keep on spending. <laughs> well, these are the hard numbers for for June. Uh, there was a little over two, but two point two million dollars was the revenues that came in. So the projections for those three months was just a little over six million dollars. So we actually have a windfall in year two so far of one hundred and seventy one thousand dollars, and then of course that averages out about fifty seven thousand dollars a month uh, windfall. <coughs> That's the first time we've been able to report that like that. So looking at it overall with both years, uh, SPLOS year one and SPLOS year two, so the total revenues for both years is about 29.7 million. Uh, the projection for, for those two years was just a little over 30 million. And we're still showing, uh, with overall, the it's, it's shortfall about $238,000. But monthly, if you break that down monthly, it's only about a $16,000 shortfall. So fairly minimal with the size of the program. 
And then last but not least is the bond obligations. Um, as Rich has mentioned in the past, the, the revenues be kept in, in savings until we, we make payment on the bonds, or able to make payment on the bonds. Uh, we've got one due in October 1st, uh, which is coming out, coming real quick here, about 1.3 million. And then in April, we have a, the, big, the bigger payment of about 16.3 million for a total of 17.7, about 7 million. So with that, we'll um, we'll go into the projects. And first up is is going to be our countywide digital radio system. And for the quarterly update, as we've mentioned in the past, I've asked Jay Nix with Motorola to come up and, and give you an update from his perspective out on the ground. Jay, if you would. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name morning. is Jay Nix, and I'm with Motorola. I'm the project manager on the Douglas County uh, radio system. Uh, so um, I'm going to just step through a little qu real quick site status. Uh, we, we have a meeting every two weeks as a team from both Motorola and Douglas County and the city of Douglasville as, as well. Um, from a site perspective, we're doing very well. Um, we've already done some uh, updates on the uh, equipment room at the, the uh, Douglas County SO um, and all that's gone very well. There's a couple other things we got left to do there. Um, mostly being uh, floor, we had to actually do a radar scan of the floor system. Um, we're going to have to core a couple of floors to be able to get the coaxes back out on the roof and so forth. But all the internal work in the rooms have been completed. Um, as far as the 911 dispatch center, we've already installed the foundation and the monopole there at 911. Uh, some of y'all may have seen that 150 foot monopole that's there at the end of there, um, the 911 center, NEMA. And then uh, the city of Douglasville existing tower, which will be the prime, one of the prime sites. Um, that tower, we've actually gone into that RF shelter. And um, because of the DC plant size and weight, um, actually poured the floor and put in a new foundation in there for the DC plant. So that's been completed. Um, and the DC plants right now, we're fixing to put those in order probably this week or next week so that we start um, getting those shipped in and we can start putting them in sites as well as we get those built. Now from a tower, new tower perspective, um, we have the uh, fire station five, we've already started. Uh, we've already put the foundation into the tower at fire station five and the shelter foundation. We did that last week and the week before. Um, we're gonna be um, involved in the conduits and grounding and so forth at fire station five. A little later this week, and then we're going to move to Bill Arp and start installing foundations there at the Bill Arp Park site. Um, the Fire 8, Fire 11 will be shortly thereafter. We've already received FA and SHPO um, for both Fire 8 and 511 as well. So that's four of those um, new exist new sites that we've got. Um, the uh, the other site that that we uh, also have. Um, been able to get started on is the Fulton County Fire 13. Now that's going to be a, um, a co-locate tower. It's an existing tower and on that tower property, Fulton County also had an additional older age uh, run 80 400 foot guide tower. Part of the deal between Douglas County and Fulton County was to remove that old tower so that y'all could go on that site, that tower, without having to pay reoccurring fees. So that tower, we're going to start the removal of that tower um, this Wednesday, okay? So um, we're moving pretty well on, on the project side on that. Um, now we've got the Austell gas site, which is got which I call the um, basically the seventh site. That Austell gas site, uh, both fire chiefs and the MA directors have been working with Austell gas, and right now they're currently um, in negotiations to get an IGA sign. Once we get that done, we've really already done the survey and we've also uh, completed FA and have <coughs> approval on the FA. So we'll, have, we'll submit the SHPO at that point in time for the historical and, and the uh, EPA documents. Okay. Um, moving forward, we also have a, a site that, that y'all have approved to pursue was the South Douglas site. And I know that the chief and Mark have been uh, in in negotiations with the landowner for that property purchase down there in South Douglas, across from Fire Station 4 and the uh, school. And then we've got the city on property, which is um, <coughs> basically just being, uh, it's basically a negotiation right now from the city standpoint, but 
um, factory shelves, which is at the corner of school, uh, school shelves road and uh, 92. So um, uh, those are the three that are, that are pending right now. I would say Austell Gas is in pretty good shape, but the uh, South Douglas, uh, Austell Gas and South Douglas are in pretty good shape. And really the one ones kind of uh, in delinquency is really the factory shelves where the city owns right now. So we met with the city on the 16th, which was last week. Um, discussed it with them. They are aware of, of what we want to do out there and what needs to be done out there for this radio system. And um, so they're pursuing that. And uh, we'll be meeting with them further in the next week and two. Um, also, to let you know where we're at with the fire learning system or the fire station <coughs> learning system, um, the fire station learning, we have uh, set up a date that we'll actually stage where um, the chief, the IT people will be going down there to. Um, uh, Mulberry, Florida to uh, mock alert or DCR's uh, plant for the staging of fire station alerting before it ships out and we start installing it as well as the RF system itself which the RF system we've already started ordering equipment uh, it will be staged in Elgin at our plant in, in uh, Elgin, Illinois and that date is set for the week of December 3rd so we'll be up there that entire week <coughs> doing the staging and the testing for the system before it ever comes out. Um, that means that we we need to get these delinquent sites built and uh, get them ready to go so that we can start putting equipment in when equipment gets here. Um, but currently, right now, that's where we're at on this project. Are there any questions? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson has a question for you. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll, I'll, again, my questions are not coming from a technological perspective, so they're, they're broad. Okay. Um, uh, just like with. Um, residential phone coverage there is a gap of coverage um, and the whole premise behind this project uh, of which is one of the largest dollar items was to provide <coughs> our public safety uh, multiple functions the capacity to be able to talk amongst themselves and across jurisdictions um, with the, the, the towers um, and all is being put in and everything and again whatever this diagram this architecture is how much cover I mean will we have every spot very simple question will every place in Douglas County be covered well I'd be crazy to tell you that <coughs> everything's 100 percent but what we guarantee is 95 percent uh, coverage and we did that um, two, there's basically two folds one is 20 dB in building coverage for the city of Douglasville and then the 10 dB for the uh, county for in building so uh, we, we are guaranteeing a 95% coverage, and that's in the contract. Okay. All right, so I'm going to leave my second question, which I appreciate your answer. You represent Motorola, right? Yes, sir. All right, so to staff, uh, and Mark, I'm okay with however you would like to have whoever answers this, which is, is this an acceptable, like within that 5%, what does that mean for us? What does that mean that, okay, 5% don't get through? I mean, you can't make the top, I mean, what does that mean? I don't understand, so please. Go ahead. Basically, it's how many times, like, you, go, you pick up your radio, you click that button 100 times. Okay. 95 out of that 100 um, times that you're going to give that um, transition. It's just a guaranteed standard, which is very high. We went higher. A lot of people go 80, uh, 90, and lower 90s and stuff like that. But we wanted that extra. That's, and we're paying for it. But the other two, the... No, that's, the that's correct. And... Uh, like I said, this was uh, in the RFP that we responded to, mm -hmm. and that was a requirement based on the RFP, and so we responded to that, and we, we're guaranteeing that. Is it, yeah, building coverage is yes. what we really want to get into. That, that, go ahead, Greg. Um, yeah. Building coverage is what this system is really all about. Can you, can you go to the... Oh, sorry, please. Greg Wicker, Douglas County Highway Director. Uh, the building coverage is what this is really all about. Uh, as we found out in a uh, drill, um, mass shooting uh, drill exercise at uh, Mason Creek Ele Elementary uh, or Middle School a little while ago, two weeks ago. Uh, our communication coverage, as we knew, would not get out of the buildings as, as we needed to, especially uh, in emergency situations we needed to. The 800 is a, is a whole different technology, and that's what this is geared up about. So the 95 that he's talking about, that's 95 in buildings as well. Yes. We don't have that now. Currently, Chief, I don't even want to take a, a guess at what we have now, but it would be, I would put it at the 50% mark, maybe. Uh, and, major and homes. We have problems in the schools. And we have problems in the schools. And, and another thing that uh, needs to be addressed or covered is uh, there were buildings that were sited 
uh, there was a, a 71, buildings. 71 buildings in the county that will be tested when the system is complete to make sure that they meet our needs in emergency situations, hospitals, schools, public safety buildings, government buildings. So that's another part of the process that will have to be a test, tested and accepted, Commissioner Robinson, before we're satisfied with accepting the system from Motorola. That's, so that, that's a whole other thing that we get into before we accept it and say, it, that it works to our satisfaction. All right, and, and I'll leave, it was just my last third question was more of our, in, in 71 buildings, what I heard are large buildings, schools, acad you know, academic, um, high density. What about wooded areas, all right? What, what about when you're, that's really where I'm, I'm concerned about. I, well, I understand. We, what we actually do, and um, as we go through this project, um, you'll see more about it, but, um, we actually break out the entire county in grids, okay, grid sized. And right now I don't have the grid sizes for the county, but my engineers will be putting that together very shortly for, for the coverage perspective. But we break out the entire county in the grid and we test every grid. Um, there's a test that actually captures, of, of all of our equipment, that captures the actual uh, receipt sensitivity, the signal strength and so forth in each grid, as well as a you know, a, a personable test is actually picking up the radio and actually making sure you can talk in those areas. No, I appreciate it. And um, it, it's not a, a validation of a solution I was looking for. I'm just looking for some clarity on a couple of points that I had okay. interest in, but I'm going to yield to my both technology and my um, public safety um, head, Madam Chair, Chairman, to sort of, I, I may double back with them and ask them some more specific questions. So I yield, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you thank so much. You. Yeah. Commissioner Geiger, I believe you have a comment. Yes, yes um, in my house, I have Wi-Fi, and yes, I had to put a booster mm -hmm. uh, to reach the furthest away from the... the yes, ma'am, a bidirectional amplifier. <coughs> Pardon? A bidirectional amplifier. Yeah. Uh, is there any such thing that we could use to reach the other 5% that we could put on a tower to boost? Well, I'm just telling you what we're guaranteed for, uh -huh. but... That doesn't mean that, we're, right. that what we actually achieve is not more than 95%. Right. Um, but uh, if we have a, or if you had a building area that were, um, you know, that were subject to part of this 5%, then absolutely we put a bidirectional amplifier in that. Okay, okay, so like a school, if it yes, was in one of those yes, kind of gray areas that we're yes, talking about, you could put a booster. Yes, ma'am, we'd be a bi bidirectional amplifier. Okay. We actually have it in the code, our, our building code section, that if we can't get that radio coverage, the builder has to install that amplifier. Okay. So, I just want to let y'all know that. Okay. Commissioner uh, Mitchell. So, just a couple quick questions. So, is this a microwave or a booster? Well, all of the sites are actually conjoined with microwave. Okay. Because the microwave is a more secure way of but providing the network right. capability. Right. So all of these towers will have a ring to topology. Yeah. Okay, microwave. Yeah. And, and when we talk about 95 and 5% that we're missing, we're not really missing 5%. No, sir. It's what you guys are guaranteeing, but it's, as stated earlier, if we hit this radio 100 times, there could be a possibility that it may not connect once or twice or whatever, but the, the whole system is designed to cover Douglas County. That's correct. And some. That's because correct. coming on Cobb, uh, it should. Well, the beauty of this system is, is it's tied into the Cobb Master. That's correct. So um, not only are you getting the coverage from Douglas County, but also Cobb County as well as Forsyth and, and uh, Bartow as well, and some, some talk groups, some specialist cop talk groups. So um, moving forward, as the chief and SO and PD to start start to put together templates for the radios, there will be talk groups that they negotiate with Cobb, um, Forsyth, mm -hmm. uh, Bartow to be able to uh, add into the system so that, that we can turn those on and be able to go in a wide area. Got it, got it. And, and there were some pockets, and Chief, you might want to kind of help me with this, there were some pockets where we didn't have any coverage was our major concern, more so than the mere fact of, I know you're saying 95, I look at it 100%, it's just that, um, what you're guaranteed. Yes, sir. But those pockets, Chief, that, that we had issues with, and that's the reason for actually going with this type of a system and going with Cobb and so on. Well, and 
the location of the towers yes uh, is really going to help with those areas we're having problems with we have problems down along the Chattahoochee River mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and we also had some problems that are out there on I-20 near Thornton Road mm -hmm. uh, right. so with the tower locations and this system <coughs> uh, that should be eliminated yes sir. frequency wise too you're going from a VHF frequency which is very high at 150 megahertz mm -hmm. basically to 170 um, in the public safety band and um, you're going now to an 800 megahertz frequency that's licensed and your spectrum is totally different designed by the FCC so um, um, you really I mean, it's, a, it's a that frequency because it's a smaller wave because of the higher frequency it's actually penetrating better it penetrates buildings better mm -hmm. it's going to get into the, all those those areas a lot better than than the VHF did. And I think that was the other part I was going to say the penetration of concrete and other you know steel right. and all that other good stuff right is that 95 percent steel as well or is that something that we'll just kind of look at on a case by case well it's, it varies based on whether it's in the city the city limits is actually 20 dB mm -hmm. uh, loss basically we test that to so that we're actually verifying that we can speak in those very high concentrated buildings mm -hmm. and then in the county the rest of the county is more of a 10 db in the got, got it okay all right thank you i yes. okay. yeah. Commissioner yeah very very quick because i know we got another presentation before us uh when you're talking about uh well first of all we're talking about a minimum of 95 percent right. coverage right and the uh, most immediate uh, probably typical response is well, what about the what about the five percent and first of all, we're talking about the five, uh, 95 percent minimum. So it could, it, at the end of the day, when it's plugged in and switched on, it could be 96, 97, 98 percent. Right. We'll, I mean, we'll, I'm, we'll, I've been doing this for 30 years, mm -hmm. and um, we're very conservative on our guarantees. Um, and I can assure you that well, everyone I've ever been involved in, um, and um, I would not, you know, I, I would say it's going to be better than 95. Yeah. But, to, and, to, and to that point, say it's uh, lacks coverage two, two percent. Uh, the reality of the economic reality of that is, <coughs> if you're looking for a hundred percent, that's correct. You're talking about a huge, huge increase in, in cost. Price, right, in correct. cost. So we may be talking about a, you know, a, a field that's that's got a concrete bunker, you know, twenty feet underground. You know, I'm being facetious, but. That, that's the kind of one or two percent coverage we're talking about paying uh, many more dollars for. It's just that's not, correct. It's and you're talking about additional sites, that's what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, additional sites, so the, so the cost goes up hugely to get, that's the, right. get that final. And currently, what you have right now with VHF <coughs> is basically one transmitter site, yeah. a couple of remote slave type sites mm -hmm. for receive only. And uh, what we're going to is nine transmitter sites throughout the county. And I, and I think what the important thing is, is not to miss is that we're focusing on schools and, and buildings specifically to have, uh, let's say, all near perfect coverage. Yes, sir. And, and that's where the people are. Yes, sir. And so I yield back. Okay. Thank you. Any more, more questions? Thank you. I that's Thanks for your time. Thank you, gentlemen. <coughs> So with that, we'll continue to look for projects. Um, as far as ambulances for this year, uh, Chief's got a budget about four hundred fifty thousand dollars. We've got two on order. Uh, we should have those in by the end of the year. I think there's been some delay in fabricating, but they they are actually being fabricated now. Uh, the fire truck. Um, the proposals were received, and I think the chief and I are going to be reviewing that with the uh, uh, fire committee. They've got a recommendation to move forward with one of those proposals, and we look forward to, to seeing that uh, next month. Station three. So we've um, <coughs> built in the process of finalizing the contract. Um, everybody's we're, we're eager to get this project started and get it underway. Uh, we need a, a notice to proceed for Titus, who was awarded the um, who was awarded the contract. Um, we'll set up a pre-construction meeting. The main thing Chief and I and Scott are working on is trying to get the temporary housing set up. Uh, we've got to get the folks out and get them in that before we can start the demolition. So looking forward to get that one started. We've got a March uh, 2019 completion date on it, and I think at this point we're, we're set to hit that. Uh, staff vehicles, Chief has three trucks on order. Uh, they should be in by sometime in the fall. We don't see any delays in those. And that wraps it up for um, 
for fire, and we'll move into uh, Mr. Miguel's department. So the transport, uh, the transportation, we currently got budgeted three million. Some of that's going towards the L Mig resurfacing for a match. We're showing a December completion date on that. I think the contract actually gives them a little bit more time in that. Um, but no change in this. We're waiting on C.W. Matthews, who was awarded the contract, to come in and, and get started on their on their resurfacing. We're eager to get them in, and hopefully we'll we'll have some good weather this fall. Let them they'll be able to complete the the resurfacing by December. Uh, the next two slides we've got these in here for placeholders for the LMIG um, funding for the, the work that's done in-house by the maintenance office. This first one just shows the amount of the of the LMIG funds are right around 1.3 million, and we'll we'll track that as uh, as maintenance gets the gets the work done. And then the second one is actually the um, is the match on the 1.3 million that will come out of the SPLOS dollars, and this is the main reason we've got it in here so we can track those dollars as as they're being spent along with the other swap funds. Uh, Riverside Parkway street lights. Um, I've got that in here as a placeholder. We're, um, we still haven't received an invoice from Greystone and we look to looking forward to get that uh, in and, and get it paid out and we'll, we'll take that out. There's a section of the street lights that uh, I've talked to them and David's been out a couple times. It's not burning. But they they got some problems with getting power to that. It's not the installation of, of the poles. Uh, Lee Road Extension uh, study is ongoing. Uh, as you know, it was extended. Uh, no problems there, and I'll keep reporting on that. The, the deliverables for the reports are due sometime around October. Stuart Mill Road. Um, so we've Miguel and I met with Jacobs, who came in. Uh, around August the 9th. Uh, we had a good meeting with them. They have brought in a, 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 pro, a, a project manager uh, that I think is going to do a real good job of communicating with, with us and keeping that project <laughs> going. We are looking at about a four to five month design time for it. And then of course we'll be in the right away phase and uh, we'll, it'll be probably sometime in the spring of next year before we get this project let, depending on the right of way acquisitions that will have to be made. Let me ask you a question. Sure. I'm sorry. No, you can't. Go ahead. <laughs> exactly. You know, we're talking. We're talking about a, a, a five-month uh, phase of, of uh, planning and design, and then uh, right away acquisition. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would think uh, probably a junior engineer would probably come out there and see what you're going to do and determine what land you're going to need uh, for the footprint. Isn't there a way to? Uh, to uh, kind of put things out of, out of sequence and start working on acquisition before you have a design. I'm not an engineer, so uh, yeah. Or is that just uh, on one of the Ten Commandments on uh, road, con road <laughs> you know, construction? You don't break. I'll let Miguel come up and, and speak to that. So several things come into play, and uh, I know you got utilities uh, and yeah. uh, and private property and, and so forth. But some way we can uh, uh, not sequence so much, but do do things at, you know at the same time. Uh, yes, uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Commissioner. Good morning. Uh, the, uh, we do have a sense of what right of way we're going to be acquiring, uh, but this, this is a second uh, design effort on the project. What we like to do is identify all of the right of way that we're going to need before we approach the property owner. And in this particular case, they're having to verify some of the items. <coughs> so, for example, the, uh, the right of way itself, we have a good handle on the easements is what's at issue. And as soon as they do the survey, which is one of the first items they're going to do, and confirm that the design is not going to change very much from the original, then we would be in position to go ahead and begin the acquisition of, of the right of way. We are in the process of getting uh, title searches underway for all those parcels, so we are moving forward and as soon as we confirm that what was shown on the plan initially by way of easements and right of way is still valid and then we'll be in position to move forward. Was some of the right of way already purchased? Or? Some of the right of way was already purchased, yes. Are you, you're headed again. Thank you, back. Okay. Commissioner Guider, I believe you have a question for me. Yes. Uh, could we not be working on the utilities? We know they've got to be moved, and we have an idea where they're going to have to be moved to. Yes. <coughs> this is a very dangerous intersection. 
Utilities are along the same lines as well. We're ahead of the game because the, the original design identified a lot of the work that's going to be needed, but we want to confirm by way of the survey that the second effort of design is not going to change things. But as soon as we understand that that's the case, then we'll be able to move forward with that as well. So when would the survey be done, did you say? Or did you say? No, I, I, I didn't. Uh, what I said was that the survey to confirm the original alignment is one of the first efforts that they're going to undertake. So I would. Who is I they? The design consultant. Okay. Jacob. Jacob. <coughs> uh, so uh, I would anticipate that between now and say the end of September, perhaps early uh, October, they would have had their survey teams out there and uh, begin the process of pinning down to make sure that there's no changes needed in the Well, I know up there at the other intersection on Stuart Mill that the utilities is a big problem and, mm -hmm. and it just seems like that could have been done a long time ago. <laughs> I'm not hear my uh, Commissioner uh, Munker. It just seems like um, we've just drug our feed on the, these two projects. I, I agree, Commissioners. Um, we learned our lesson from last <coughs> in that particular project that we want to make sure we get the right of way all completed before we bid the project out. Uh, so we'll certainly do that in this case. All right. Are you back? Okay. Thank you, Director. We could have bid them on. Next project is uh, is John West Road. This project is about 95% complete. This is SEI. Um, they're moving along with it very well. Miguel is uh, doing the right of way uh, uh, acquisition on it right now. We hope to be able to let this project in the fall with no no issues come up with the right of way. We're not anticipating that. Um, with a, we're showing a completion date of September of next year for this. So this moving along. Sweetwater Church Road. So, Pauling, Can Pauling County came in and uh, we had a good meeting with them, a uh, good productive meeting. Um, we're, Miguel is finalizing the IGA with them. Uh, they're doing some uh, touch up work on the design and the and surveying. Uh, once we get that done, we'll be able to we'll look and advertise this project in December. So, it's, it's finally moving. The, I think the good news was is after they went back and made some adjustments in the design, it's very, very little uh, right away impact. Uh, just a couple parcels and it shouldn't be any problem uh, acquiring those and getting this project ready to let in right around December. Chapel Hill Road, um, we're in the preliminary stage with this project and we're, Miguel is going to be reviewing, uh, so we're looking at a couple different design options for it as far as uh, right, uh, curb and gutter and, right, and, and sidewalk for that project, whether it'll be on both sides of the road or one course that's going to impact cost and, and, and scope for the project so we need that decision made before SEI will move forward in, in, in designing it once we get that information to them we'll be uh, back on track with the design and, and looking to have that completed by the end of the year <coughs> highway 5 project we're going to go out with an RFP for design consultants with that Miguel's went through a couple things with funding with, we're back at a point now to where we thought we would do this with all SPLOS dollars. Uh, so we'll go out with an RFP to uh, uh, acquire a consultant to, to design the project for that right turn lane. Um, Commissioner yeah. Yes. Have we contacted anybody about buying the right of way on that one? On that project? Not, not yeah. at this point, no. We haven't even talked to them? Well, Miguel, I, I'm, you haven't really had any, <coughs> you've done a little bit of research on it, but. No, uh, particularly because there's there's the issue of the signs that might be in the way. So there's going to be a little bit of design that we need to do <coughs> before we can identify all the right of way that we well, My concern is that the lot's for sale. And if somebody else comes in there and buys it and with no idea that we want to carve some of the right of way <coughs> out of there. So... Um, it just seems like we ought to have preliminary talks with the owner at this time. Any comment? <laughs> well, 
<coughs> the, uh, the corner parcel is the one that's for sale, not, not the rest of it. So it impacts the, where the gas station used to be. Um, that's what I'm saying. That lot is for sale. And if somebody comes in there thinking they can use all of that lot for the impervious surface and whatever, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, how big the building is, they buy it on that contingency. So I just wonder, have we even talked with the owner of our interests in 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 buying? We got to have the right of way, or we can't have the project. Correct. We have not had any direct contact with the owner about purchasing the right of way, uh, but we can do some preliminary discussions. So they don't even know we're interested in buying it. They are aware that uh, that there is a, a project, a proposal for, for a right turn lane, so they're aware that uh, <coughs> potentially that could happen. But we have not approached them about purchasing the, that sliver of land before. Well, it's going to be more than a sliver there, I think, isn't it? <laughs> well, I don't know, but it, it's going to carve out of the lot, which so... And there's a big sign for sale, and it's got so many acres or whatever it is, uh, an acre plot. Um, so it concerns me that um, we haven't, you know, <coughs> talked to somebody about it, that we are definitely interested in buying part of that for the right way. So. <coughs> are you back? Okay. <laughs> I, think, I don't disagree with, with Madam Dad. I, I think just the approach to hope that somebody's not, I hope they're not listening to us having interest and they turn around and jack up the price, you know, as we have that conversation. Um, I, but I, I think it's something that should be looked at, um, anticipatory. Um, I, I just got to go back to a previous question. It's just something about payments, because this is what triggered me uh, about um, Greystone and lights <coughs> down Riverside. And you don't have to go back to it, but it's more of a just for the note for the record, which is 100 some odd lights, 95% are on for the sake of the conversation. So you've got this group of five that's off, and now we realize you can't get power to it. And, and, and we go back to like we're very, we're, we're always held to be accountable. And I, I got to go back to this accountability thing, right? So where's the accountability on our partner that says, okay, but, and wait a minute, y'all waiting for an invoice to pay? And it's not on yet? No, I can't agree with that. You need all the lights on. Now, I don't know what the agreement is. Ken, Jennifer, we can talk about this later. Um, company um, attorney and um, director of finance. But it's like, no, that's not acceptable. We won't, yes, sir, we won't pay them until the project's completed. Okay. And, and I, I'm that's just making it for the record. It just, uh, and, and this is not uh, our program manager. Y'all are facilitating this. Our whole point to have a conversation. But, but wait, wait, wait a minute. Y'all know how long we've been doing this, having this conversation. And so for me, it's just like, okay, we finally got 95% on. We've got this 5%. And it's sort of almost like a slide. Just looks like, okay, well, we couldn't get all the power to it. Well, what's going on? But yet I hear them saying, well, hey, we got to get this invoice in here to pay it. Like, no, don't do that. Uh, there needs to be some accountability there, and I just, you know, uh, there, there's something missing here on that part right there. And again, we recognize that Greystone is not, they subcontracted it. <coughs> so really, we're not really against Greystone. It's like, come on, Greystone, or uh, Director Peacock, maybe it's time for a phone call, but it's like, where is the accountability that subcontracted It's sort of like, what's going on here? <coughs> that's a lot of lights. That, that, that's huge ongoing revenue. So it's not just the installation, but it's the ongoing for Greystone. So where's the, where's the, I, I just don't feel something here. Something's missing, and it's just sort of plodding along. And it's like, guys, I'll yield with that. So, um, Madam Chair, I just asked if Mark, can y'all double back on that and just find out what's going on? Because here we go, every month there's something, and I drive down there every, almost every night. And I know what the issue is, but it's just like, come on, guys. It's like it's not a priority. We've heard that before, which is such an insult that we're spending that we're going to spend that type of money. And it's like, well, we'll get around to it when we get around to it. And it's like, can y'all look into that, please? Are you? Yes, sir. Thank you. Totally understand, Commissioner. We certainly won't pay the, the invoice until we get the lights completely on. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, the next project, Highway 92 at uh, Adam Wakey Road. For this project, due to the complexity of it. 
potentially. Um, we'll be going out, Miguel and I have talked about it, for a scoping study with this, which will be an added phase to it. Um, so they can go in and study and do a, a feasibility study and, and start laying out some possible layouts for the, for the solution to what we need out there. Uh, we've currently got this budgeted at, at $6 million, which it could be that, the cost on it could go that high if we end up doing uh, a complete re relocation of either one of those roads. But it's just a placeholder for right now, but we are, with, with these intersections, we're starting to put some placeholders in them so we can see some better numbers. And those will be defined more so as we get into the design and get some consultants on board to start working up some hard numbers. Well, to that point. Uh -huh. And this is something to uh, my, my co-chair. Like, what happens if we get in here? And again, this is just for the broad board of commissioners, but also for us to say, like, okay, we get in here, and this six million dollar budget really turns out to be twelve million, right? And, and and not to say that we we, we need to make an amendment to the SPLOS consideration. I'm, I'm not talking about that, but what happens if, in fact, we it just we thought this. We now know truth because obviously design gives us a better understanding of what true costs are for construction. Um, and we have to pause that. And I have no problem with you know going back to the public, but what do y'all think about do we take it off the list? Because once now we've gotten into this thing, it's like, okay, that's gonna have a real impact or or there's some sacrifices downstream. And we're gonna probably have to have that conversation. So so far we've gotten through this, so you know, we were able to massage the edges. But this is one's like, okay, guys, I don't know about this one. You talking about a relocate? That that's major. That I don't <coughs> see that coming in. So I yield the thoughts. Yeah, I, Madam Chair, I, I concur with uh, Commissioner Robinson. Uh, this is a th this would be a great project to accomplish, uh, but I, I'm concerned about really what the ultimate cost is versus the uh, the ultimate benefit uh, to it. So we just need to monitor it very closely. I think what we're going to experience through this entire uh, <coughs> project that, that the estimates are, are un, un, not so much underfunded but uh, uh, the economy has, has blossomed to the extent that uh, steel and concrete prices are just are going up every, every week mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to have to take a hard look at our priorities as we go through this whole project and uh, I'm just concerned about being able to complete what we've got on the list right now and thank, thank goodness we did establish prior priorities early on mm -hmm. because then we're going to know what's going to have to drop off. But right. Let's closely monitor this particular project. I yield back. Okay. I totally agree. <coughs> I agree with you. Anybody have a comment? <coughs> Ms. Gables? Okay. Um, next is the Post Road Bridge at Dog River. As you know, that's a GDOT project. Miguel did attend a kickoff meeting for that a couple of weeks ago. So that pro project's moving forward with a contractor. So you don't, we'll see some delay in it, but I'll keep you updated. Uh, with the project <coughs> the contract that gets ready to move into Douglas County, I'll start reporting on it a little more frequently. Uh, I will say that I've been contacted by one of the citizens out there, and they've been contacted by GDOT for the right of way. So and it, they are purchasing right of way. Yeah, and, and negotiating. Yeah, that's good. I'll be able to. Huh? You, you're going to acquire. Yeah. You We're, do the right of way. The county is doing the right of way acquisition for that project. Okay. Well, I was told by the Albertsons that someone contacted them about the right of way. Us. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're back. Mm -hmm. So this is another project. We, we're showing a 3.3 .3 million dollar budget. But we're going to take that down. Uh, we'll 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 keep a cost in there that'll cover whatever. If there's any right of way costs or for the detour, that's the only two uh, responsibilities that the county has. Well, plus the utilities. Um, the utility cost on it. So we'll, we'll lower that budget quite a bit. Uh, the next three, three projects are the, the school projects. SEI has been awarded that contract and they're on, they're on board and working. They're doing some preliminary surveys at all the sites. So we've got those programmed now uh, showing a cost. Um, and we're showing an August uh, of 2019 completion date on it. And at this point in time, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to hit that. Um, in Chestnut Lodge, <coughs> New Manchester High. And with that, we'll, uh, Miguel is, uh, with his uh, equipment purchases, he's got two, two dump trucks and I reported on this last month in one pickup that should be in by the end of the year. That's got a budget of about $400,000.
So that will move into Parks and Rec, Gary. So these first two projects we've, uh, I think Gary's already had some discussion with the Parks Committee. Uh, it's the Boundary Waters Concession Building, which is paired up with the Boundary Waters Soccer Field Lighting. As you know, we took bids on that. The bids came in um, higher than what we had estimated, so we're looking at, uh, I think some more information needs to be gathered up to make a final decision on whether to award uh, that low bid or not. So we've, that's kind of on hold until we get that decision made. <coughs> <clears throat> the multi-purpose rec center Deer Lake Park tennis court lights uh, Cardi Watkins has been awarded that we just got to finalize contracts and I think they've already done some uh, preliminary work on it they're ready to get started and it shouldn't take very long to, to get that project designed and, and out on the street and then the next one is our big project in parks is the multi-purpose rec center um, I think Gary's already reviewed. We, the, the Sutton Architects came out with a basic three, three schemes for the, for the building, um, primarily based on scope and budget. Sounds like we've got a decision uh, to move forward with one of those. We need to get some more information back to the committee. Um, once we do that, we'll, uh, we'll be able to um, get Sutton Architects back on, back on track. They've completed a lot of the surveying out at the site, so they've done a good bit of work now to get it to this point. Um, once we make a decision on the footprint, he'll be, he'll, be ready, he'll be ready to move forward with completing the design on it. And also, we keep talking about doing a public information meeting, um, but a final decision needs to be made on that footprint before we do that. Next up is the Senior Center. We had our kickoff meeting on July 31st. Uh, it was a good meeting uh, with uh, Commissioner Mitchell and uh, I think we gave the architects some good interest. Carter and Watkins gave them some good feedback. Uh, so they're moving along there out there surveying the property now and um, hopefully get that uh, nearing design stage uh, towards uh, the fall. The last two for parks is Bill Art Park and, and Fair Play Park. These two both have uh, engineers estimates in that are right at the current budget and again these will be some discussion that we'll need to have with the parks committee to whether as to whether to move forward with <coughs> with these designs which we're ready they're about 95 percent complete uh, we could probably put them on the street within within 30 days uh, once we got a decision to that we're okay with the price because we the what we got to throw in the mix there is the fencing that's whether or not we're gonna have the funds to, to be able to um, replace all the fencing at both parks and maybe reduce the scope of that or, or not do it at all Uh, the last one is the Fair, Fair Play Park light replacement. Uh, we have a budget of $400,000. Lose is on the agenda for, for them to approve them to do a, a small set of plans and specs. We hope to have that project ready to advertise by the end of this month and get it on the street. Uh, as we all know, it's the, the, the poles are out there in pretty, pretty bad shape and we need to get them replaced. So that's moving along very the well. Months it was on the prior months. Prior months. It's already been approved. Good deal. So, um, they're, they're, they're out there working. We should have it, like I said, we should have it ready to go to, to bid by the end of the month. Last but not least, uh, uh, Gary's equipment. And most all of his equipment's already been in for this year. He had a $100,000 budget, and he's got a, a small amount remaining. And then the last slide is our program management fees. And uh, we're in a second task order. It started at the beginning of the year and run through the end of this calendar year. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll take any further questions from the board. We have one question from Commissioner Robinson. Yeah, I'll move on. Um, you mentioned something about boundary waters. No, you, you mentioned restroom uh, tied to the soccer field. Now, looking at the agenda, you talked about Deer Lake. I want to make sure I get where y'all plan on putting this. Um, and, um, one, I think that's probably a, a typographical. Um, well, the Deer Lake restroom facility and tennis courts, part of the tennis court rebuild is to rebuild the, 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 the uh, restroom facility there as well. Okay. So that is at Deer Lake. All right. And then we have the concession stand and restrooms at Boundary Waters as well. Totally Hi, different projects. I said, 
listening to his comment was tied to the soccer field, is what I, I was I focused on. So Boundary Water it, Park is the, is the that is tied to the soccer field line. Okay. So and and I, and I, I say that it, it is two different projects, uh -huh. and we were looking at the <coughs> you know, we'd already had a bid on the lights, and it actually came in higher than the budget for the for just the lights. And so we were we wanted to get the concession building out on the street, which we now we have, uh, so that we could look at the combined budget for both of them. We were hoping to get a little bit better bid on the concession building, but unfortunately it's come in high too. So now we're looking at an overall, I think, ab above our budget of a couple hundred thousand dollars for both of those projects. But they are separate projects. Separate projects, but you're trying to leverage the two to get better pricing, and they didn't come in. I mean, no, they were separate. They were bid out separate. They were bid out. They were separate. bid out separate. We were just, we were, I guess, looking at both budgets because we knew we had the, the, the lighting budget was over. Uh, I think the budget was 160 and it came in at about $300,000 for the lights. Mm -hmm. And then, the, of course, the building was, the budget was about 650 and it came in at 710. So it was somewhere between 150 to $200,000. It, you know, it doesn't mean we got to move forward with the, the soccer field lights, but we were looking at it as a, from a budget standpoint. But they, it, uh, it didn't, you know, we were hoping for some better bids on the concession building. All right, now I'm, I'm going to yield to my, my, my parks rep to give, help give a little bit more clarity on, we have a SPLOS project we've got, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on Boundary Waters restroom, um, press box, because it serves both football and soccer, right? So there's, there's a purpose behind my question. Put the tennis courts to soccer, but put, put the other parks to soccer. Where do we stand on that one right there alone? Do we think we need to, was that the comment that was made that it, the low bid came in higher than, I'm, I'm trying to clarify what he said, so. Yeah, so we do have, we have, bids came in, the bids were too high, so they were about 50 to $60,000 higher than what we had anticipated, <coughs> just for the restroom slash concession stand. So, Parks and Rec community gave Gary some direction <coughs> or some ways we could possibly cut one or both of those budgets with the restroom concession stand and the, the lights. Because we were just trying to leverage the budget of both of them to get both projects to, to fit. That's what so I'm saying. That's where we're at right now. Just, and I, it I, is on the agenda, but we're going to pull it off right. when, when we get to it and <coughs> put it on next time. Okay. Because we've got some more information to get on those projects. All right. and, and again, one more time, being accountable for assets. So. Um, We've got a football field. Gary, have we had any formal play on our football field that we, we built from the 2002 SPLOS that we built what, a couple years ago? Have we had any formal play on it yet? No, we, have, we haven't had any formal play due to the fact that there's a restaurant <coughs> facility there or a concession stand. Yeah. But once this concession restaurant uh, is built, then we anticipate that either Boundary Waters will start a new football program, or Beulah, who plays at Yearlick now, will move their program down to Boundary Waters. Okay. Again, just for the record, so the public understands, I'm, I'm fully aware that you've got a football field that's brand new, that's been sitting out there for two seasons with no nothing on it, and yet we're, we're working through this restaurant, which is important, which is why I don't want it to fall too far behind. So it's sort of like I'm hoping my colleagues will make a good decision to keep that on track that we don't lose a third seat. <coughs> so I yield my chair. I know, I know they don't talk about it. Okay. Ms. Scott, do you have a comment? Yes. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Scott, you a concession stand cost as much as all the renovations for the fire department in District 3. I mean, um, at Station 3. Mm -hmm. And that's got a lot more infrastructure in it and everything. I don't understand why a concession stand, which is mostly a shell with some interior walls, uh, cost as much as a, a fire station. It, well, you know, all of it coming above budget. Um, the fire station is, you know, it was this, this renovation and we were, all, we were only adding about a thousand square feet to the fire station. You know, we had that, that budget was a good bit less than what it, what it came in at. Uh, so it's, I think it's two different, uh, certainly two different types of structures. And the, a new concession building with with the materials that we're putting in it and the size of it, it's, it I'm sure is Does it have thing. a meeting room upstairs? A staff meeting room upstairs, yes. Staff meeting yeah. room upstairs. Yeah. 
and it's built to handle two, and it's got two concessions. It's got one for the, obviously for the soccer field, one for the football field. Mm -hmm. So it, it was, you know, because of that, it's, it's, it's a little high, it was higher. Well, even, even the one, I don't know if it's Bill Art that has concession stand. Do they have a concession stand that they're going to have built to or replace? Both, yes, that's what we're currently having on the tables. <laughs> and uh, it costs almost as much as <laughs> Yeah, they are. It's just amazing. It's, it's, it's surprising the architects, too. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, we talked about that last month. It's just where the economy is. The, they, they have work, and they, the, the, the square foot price is, is over $200, and they're staying with that. It, it's, it's not changed yet. Um, we, we may see that as, it, as we move through the program. Hopefully we will. And we haven't really got into a lot of Miguel stuff. Uh, it could do, you know, very easily be doing the same thing. Commissioner Mitchell and, and, and I know Commissioner Mulk here will probably want to chime in on some of this though, but it's it's more about the cost of, of just doing business now. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I think somebody may have mentioned about that earlier. That it's, you know, that's where we, the cost is starting to kind of take a a, 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 pipe, a peak, rather, and, and where we're going with this with parks and we're going to in any building. So just FYI, it, that's why these numbers are starting to kind of look the way they are. Yeah. Um, and Parks and Rec, we did kind of took a hard look at how can we offset some of these costs from the mere fact of building something else down the road as opposed to building it now. And we're trying to make those types of adjustments to kind of make it work, but the numbers are kind of what they are, and I think when, we, when the Parks and Rec committee makes a recommendation, it's going to be a hard look at what it's going to be, what, what the reality of it is, whether we like it or not, or whether we want to kind of go in that direction or not, but the numbers are, I mean, they're getting higher per square foot, yeah. foot rather. So. Yeah, it's approaching two hundred fifty dollars yeah. per foot <coughs> right. on some of these. I mean, somehow the building is the building, and the concrete is the concrete, and getting it there is another whole story. So <coughs> these are it's, these are basic mater uh, building yes. materials for right. concession buildings. There's nothing. I mean, that's again right. what the architects keep saying. You know, it's just basic right. uh, construction materials. And they see that curve. You know, kind of coming, and so they're trying to let us know now yeah. kind of what that looks like. So we won't be surprised to say, well, it's going to cost this amount to kind of get this building done, or reduce the building, or reduce the footprint, or reduce something right. to kind of offset some costs. And the question is, do we really want to do that? So we, we, we'll make a recommendation, okay. and it's going to be a sincere one. So I yield back. Thank you. I thank Commissioner Mulcair. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Need I say more? Uh, <coughs> we uh, we have an item on here, you know, for the uh, Boundary Waters uh, concession and restrooms uh, construction. And we're going to request that it be tabled because we we were kind of shocked at the price. And we need to go back to the drawing board and see if there's some way we can mitigate the cost. Uh, and if we can't, uh, what what are our options? And if and if we can, what is the design going to be? So I, I yield back. Okay. It's an active discussion. Yes. And that's going to depend heavily on the, the, the committee. Yes, yes. The and then the full board. Board. And, then, and, then and, and the full board, board committee. Yeah, the full yeah. board as well. Yeah. I'm just saying we're going to open this recommendation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll get one. <laughs> so we're just waiting on that. And, yeah. Um, I'm just, uh, I wish, wishful thinking is always good if yeah. some of those um, <coughs> contractors will negotiate. If, are you just, are you beating the bushes that, you know, when one say no, go to another one? I'm just yeah, and so, you know, Titus. We, we're getting some local contracts. Titus is out of Carroll, Kansas. They're, they're just right, you know, they're not 40 miles away. Um, uh, Integrated, who is, has a low bid on this, they're, I think, out of Cox, Whitesburg. They're, they're in Carroll, too. These are local contractors. And, the, you know, the high bid for the um, for the for that concession building, we had we had one approaching a million dollars. You know, so, so this was at 710. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Real question. I, I think this begins the reality of where we are with inflation on, uh, yes. across yeah. the board, but just in that, you know, on the national scene, we, we know it's coming. And we, we, while I think the administration did a great job based on we went to SPLOS and went to the voters back in 16 and they approved this, it was based on certain assumptions. All right, you fast forward. <coughs> Two years later, we're a totally different place, yes. right? A totally different impact. So, uh, I, I think at the same point, there may be uh, some consideration also with the board on reducing. I mean, 
we were just talking at the bottom of the list. Um, we we yep. may have to re reset expectations amongst ourselves, thus, thus our, our districts to say, okay, we ain't gonna get there from here. We already know we can, I mean, we in this conversation, no, we're not gonna get there. It's only gonna go higher. So it's like, okay, guys, we can either kick the can and make a decision, or I, or I think put our collective wisdom together and say, look, Mark, you need to come up with sort of a, 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 some type of something for us to consider while all the committees have to sort of look at what they're looking at respectively, because it's like, it ain't gonna get better. Right. Uh, not in this time frame. So I'm sure I just, it's just something to look at. I yes. Was, it okay. just, and it was easy for Mark since he created a list that we took to the bond, um, I mean, we took to Wall Street. I think he can at least come up with a like, well, we put 70,000 in, 40,000 was for the county. We may need to come down to 30 based on, I don't know what the answer is, but something's gonna get sacrificed. I mean, there's no way around it. Well, I add though, and you're absolutely right, and, and, and we, I know every committee is probably looking at this to include the Parks and Rec. We actually kind of made that statement known, again, that the, the priority list, um, everything may not make it to the, to that, the, the low, and I'm not, I'm not speaking of below the, the priority list, but even above that line, may not make it. So that's why uh, I, I stress this to this board to continue to make sure that you stay on the priority list and stay focused how the priority list was designed and why and how we do it because if you go outside of that, as we're gonna see now, based on numbers, <coughs> everything might not make the list. And if you move and shift some things as we've done, um, you're gonna see now that you may be in trouble now. <coughs> so just FYI. I do that. Well, I'll just keep my head of optimism on. I don't believe in trouble. I believe exactly. in success. And I believe we'll do a great job. I'm just thinking positive uh, and ask you to keep working the rooms and, and, and working with those guys and negotiate and see if we get some good pricing because I know somebody will say yes. So if you could do that for her, I appreciate it. And we're going to move on to the next. Uh, our presentation would be uh, Judge McClain. You're here, and then what I'm going to do is change up a little bit. I'm going to bring number nine up to the front as well uh, to allow him to uh, just uh, give us two renditions in the interest of his time. Um, one presentation, his first presentation is Sanctuary Village Project Update. Um, Judge McClain, you have your update, and then I'm, I'll go in into number nine. Judge? Good morning. I'm Bo McClain. I'm one of your Superior Court judges. Uh, thank you for letting me be here. Uh, my purpose this morning, and I have court this morning, and I've got a courtroom full of people waiting on me, so I'm going to be brisk in what I'm presenting. Uh, my purpose is to update you on the Sanctuary Village project uh, and also to ask for the funds I need to complete the project. Uh, I'm the project manager. And my fee is zero. Hope you appreciate that. And I'm a volunteer, like a lot of people are, with Sanctuary Village to reiterate. Sanctuary Village <coughs> is a solution to homelessness issues in our county, where we're creating housing at multiple locations, not just at the landfill where this uh, presentation is oriented, but at <coughs> multiple locations to house homeless people that are in our uh, accountability court programs but also house homeless people who are just living in the woods who need the services of our accountability court programs, which include treatment, curriculum, case management, GED, job assistance, and transportation. So that's what the Sanctuary <coughs> Village concept is to reiterate. Now that's our logo, which is also donated. And uh, this is just to show you that uh, we've got three trailers from the uh, school system, which were donated, uh, moved to the site just a few days ago, and that sort of gives you a depiction of how that process works. Uh, it's very intricate. Uh, you have to uh, jack the trailers up. You have to put uh, tires on them. You have to split them in half. You have to transport them. Then you have to jack them down, take the tires off, and put them back together. So it's not an easy <coughs> process. But as you can see, it has been completed. And all three trailers are at the location at this time. Uh, they were all donated by the school system. We did have to pay the cost of moving the trailers. Uh, they're situated on the site, uh, basically, 
to, for two reasons. The situation there is based upon the septic system and the use of the existing septic system on the old animal control building, which used to sit there to save money. We're using existing resources. And also just uh, maneuvering double wide trailers onto that property was not an easy task. <coughs> so those are the two reasons why they're situated the way they're situated. This is uh, Mr. Marvin Kennedy. Uh, Marvin has donated his time to us. He is a licensed plumber, he is a licensed electrician, can pretty much do anything, and he is on site every day at Sanctuary Village for free to the citizens of Douglas County. And I visited the site actually Friday, and, and me and Marvin had a good conversation. And this kind of shows you the progress that we're making and also gives you some kind of idea as to what uh, these units will look like. There's going to be four units per trailer at a square footage of uh, 300 square feet. To give you a comparison, an average motel room square footage is 325 feet. So you're, you're sort of looking at a residence from the entrance door when you look at Marvin. And this is sort of the first area you see at the bottom of the picture. To the right will be the kitchen area where we'll have uh, the normal kitchen accoutrements, a microwave, a two burner cooktop, a small college type refrigerator, a countertop, that sort of thing. Uh, to the left of the kitchen area is a closet. Uh, hang your clothes in there. We'll have shelving under the clothing so the residents can store their belongings there. Immediately to the back there is where we'll put a single bed, and that's just all we have room for uh, in these configurations is to put a single bed under the window. And then as we walk through this area, uh, we also have a hookup you can't see for television. We'll put a flat screen TV on the wall and give the residents access to TV either through a fire stick or Wi-Fi or some other thing. We're not going to give them a cable but we are going to give them a TV to look at, either over-the-air TV or fire stick type TV, depending on the cost. And then as you uh, go past Marvin, uh, there's your bedroom there. It's very small, it's large enough to basically put a single bed up against the wall. And then as, and you have a window there, and then as you turn right, you enter the bathroom. And you'll, your bathroom sink will be here, your mirror, and then you keep going right, and you'll have your toilet and your shower surround. You can see the showers are starting to be roughed in. And we're at the point right now on these two trailers where uh, we've got all the rough in done, everything, the sheetrock up. Uh, inspections are supposed to happen this week. And once the inspections occur, then the next step is to start finishing things off. The flooring, trim, uh, finished plumbing, cabinets, sinks, toilets. Uh, lighting has already been installed. The, all the wires pulled, all the pipes in. We've also got in, uh, installed the heating and air systems as well. But we're looking at weeks. Uh, to complete this, not months, as far as these first two uh, trailers. Now, uh, let me shift to money. Uh, when I came before you originally, I asked for $40,000 of date funds. The date fund is a drug sur fine surcharge <coughs> on fines that are imposed on persons who commit crimes. And the law says that date funds can only be used for drug treatment <coughs> programs. So obviously that's what we're using it for here. And we had no clue what this would cost. Nobody's ever done this before. <coughs> that's why. So I asked y'all to give me $40,000 to get me started. Uh, and once we got started, we now know exactly what it's gonna cost to finish these two trailers and do the next three, uh, which is what the ask is for date funds for today, but the money to finish this job. So as you can see, most all of that 40 grand went to what I described as development cost. We had to spend four grand on architect plans, 
you can't, the county will not let us put up a building without architectural <coughs> drawing. It's just a code requirement or ordinance requirement. So we had to pay for architectural plans. Uh, $9,500 to transport the mobile homes. We got two uh, uh, $12,000 bids. It, it, it took months to get them to comply with the county purchasing requirements, but we got them. And we sort of cried and whined to Benfield and said, you know, you really put us through the mill here, can you cut your price? Uh, a private donor paid $2,000 of the cost and Benefield cut its price by $500 and moved the trailer. So that's a development cost. The septic plan, we went out with environmental services and said, what do we have to do to make you happy? What needs to be put here? So we've got to put another septic tank and additional fill lines at the two trailer site. And we've got to do additional fill lines at the three trailer <coughs> site where the existing septic is. That's what it's going to cost. Uh, the rest of that money is basically to pay uh, tradesmen and buy some materials. We've bought uh, paint that people turned in. We've bought sheetrock at 70% off. What we do is take damaged sheetrock, cut the damaged pieces off, and install the sheetrock because we're always looking for ways to save money and do this in a cost-effective way. So the invoices to Ideal Smart Energy, which is Mr. Tony, the contractor that's been overseeing <coughs> this for free on these two trailers, is basically to buy things like wire, showers, toilets, uh, sheetrock, paint, and pay people to frame up walls, do demo. We had an unexpected expense of, I think, around $2,500. We had to cut down a massive oak tree if you've ever been to the location, there's a gigantic oak tree that overhang the two trailers that was deemed to be dangerous to leave it there. We felt like it's going to fall someday and tear everything up. We need to get it out of there. So that was a big project to cut that uh, tree down and an unexpected uh, ex expense. So as you can see, as we stand right now, I've got 120 bucks <coughs> left. Uh, at this point in time, which is why I need a little bit more money to move through this process. Uh, to give you an idea of what we need, uh, I asked uh, Mr. Tony to come up with an actual budget in writing, uh, which I think we submitted to y'all last week at the request of the county clerk. So as you can see there, everything's broken down in terms of stuff that we've got to buy and uh, to give a total cost, you take the 40, add it to the 159, that's the total cost of this entire project from start to finish. So the ask today is for the 159. Mm -hmm. Now I wanna make another point about that. Uh, we've received 2,000 in cash uh, as a donation uh, for the mobile home transport. Uh, We've received 3,000 in cash <coughs> as a donation from the foundation. I don't want to spend that right now because I have in play with a large organization in Atlanta the possibility of a triple match on that to fund our utilities cost. Uh, they won't fund a, a capital project, but they will fund ongoing um, running of the facility and if I show them three grand they might triple match it so I want to hold that I don't want to spend it I want to use that and I, I, we're close to finalizing an agreement with them I won't say who they are because it isn't finalized we have asked Home Depot for five grand we uh, are installing what are called mini split <coughs> ductless AC heating systems and basically it's a wall unit no ductwork, where the resident can control the heating and air inside their unit. And you may have seen them in hotel rooms you've stayed at. It just kind of fits on the wall. There's some inside, there's some outside part to it. But it's a good application for this square footage. And uh, this company, at our request, uh, is selling us several units at cost. 
<coughs> so we've saved six grand from the retail price by negotiating <coughs> with these folks who want to help out what we're doing. To give you another idea of this, if you look at our total cost of $199,000, if you look at 20 units, that's a per unit cost of $9,953. To build a budget economy motel in Douglasville, that would cost you $95,000 per room. To look at it from a square footage standpoint, you're looking at a, a, a $33.17 <coughs> per square foot cost for Sanctuary Village versus if you built a, a motel, a budget motel, not a high-end motel, but a budget motel, you're looking at $293 per square foot. So I created that graphic just to give you an understanding of we're doing this as inexpensively as it can possibly be done. And we're being as frugal and as good as stewards of this state money as, as, as humanly can be done. Not to mention me donating my time, Mr. Tony donating his time, Marvin Kennedy donating his time, and other people donating their time. Now, I'm going to segue into Mr. Allen reading, who I brought with me. Can you step up for just a moment, Alan? <coughs> Alan is one of the sons of, of Reading and Sons Construction Company. He lives here in Douglas County with his family. I was introduced to Alan through mutual acquaintances at the LDS Church. And Alan stupidly agreed to help me with this, <laughs> and a decision I probably regret. But Alan is going to kind of oversee the next three trailers. Uh, and uh, I've got a rendering of what the inside of uh, Alan's trailers is going to look like. And that's what Alan's trailers are going to look like <laughs> on the inside. And it, it's a little higher end. Uh, and this is what his trailers are going to look like from the outside uh, once we get through with them, if you remember the configuration, forgive me my little joke, but uh, those are actually projects that Alan's been involved with. Uh, Breeding and Sons does high-end, high-end construction uh, in Buckhead and other affluent parts of Atlanta. So uh, a man who is used to building mansions <coughs> is, has come to the Douglas County Board of Commissioners and is asking for your help, as I am, to help build homes for the homeless at the county landfill. Alan, do you want to say a word? I'm going to be providing skilled labor as well as basic labor, all voluntary. Uh, I've been working close with Judge McClain. Uh, it's, it's a very noble cause. I love the accountability of it. Glad to be on board and I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. That's where some of these folks live now. Uh, they live in a tent. They live in the woods. Uh, they have a makeshift shower. That's what that blue tarp is, where you, you catch water and pour it on yourself. And I say we can do better in Douglas County. I know we can. And I can't thank you all enough for being as supportive as you're being with what we're doing with Sanctuary Village. I, I put that picture up there because um, I just love that picture. I, I met with the board chair a few days ago and I said, I just want to show you this picture because I think it's really cool. This is one of the gentlemen that's uh, working uh, at Sanctuary Village. Uh, he can't donate his time like I have, like Alan has, like Mr. Tony has, and like others has. He needs to get paid uh, to feed his family. Uh, so the working man is building hope for the homeless man. But one thing I'd like you to consider, if you could, is is there any way you could set this money up if you choose to give it to us through the date fund? and allow us to complete Sanctuary Village. Is there a way you can set it up to where we can do like a 25% at a time draw and have 
Mr. Teal or somebody come look and say, okay, that's fair. The reason I ask this is this. These guys are not only volunteering their time, they're loaning the county money to do this. They're paying. Mr. Tony's paying all these people. This man right here, out of his own pocket. And then waiting for us to eventually reimburse him. And I, I just don't think that's fair. That not only do we uh, graciously appreciate uh, the volunteering of their time, but for them to also advance their funds to, to pay our workers, to buy materials, and things of this nature. Uh, I'm just asking is there a way we can do it a little differently? Because right now, we're asked, we've asked Mr. Tony, and he's done it, and we're asking Mr. Breeding, and he's done it. They're just paying for this. And just whenever they get reimbursed is when they get reimbursed. And I, I'm just wondering if there's a different way we can do this. And I'm just asking <coughs> on, on their behalf. Because there's just certain things we can't get for free. Uh, we have to pay people. That's just a fact of life. Uh, that is where we're at with Sanctuary Village. We did do a lot of work at the Cornerstone site Friday. Moved a lot of furniture in there, which was donated through Faith in Action. So it's almost furnished and we'll be ready soon to move folks into there and move other folks into the <coughs> site of the farmhouse. Any questions? Any questions? Question the last Yeah, I'll be real quick. You guys have consistent to your time. Real quick, um, uh, I, I don't disagree with, you know, people were what they're worth and they should be paid what they pay. So I have no problem. I mean, I, I know sometimes we lean on the community to sort of, you know, in kind and so forth, but I, it, you, that's not a sustainable business model. So I, I do appreciate and acknowledge people who step up in the community, but we as the government also need to make sure we pay people and we don't take advantage of them that way. I, I, I have a real problem with that, so I stand in agreement. Um, as relates to that, I, I'm real quick, um, I'm looking at the ask, because there was two things here, 159,000, um, Director Hallman, how much is left in the date? Are we good? Yes. <coughs> it's eight, 800, 900,000. It's over 900,000. Right. So we, we fit well with the I, I asked that question first. <coughs> okay, well, I wanted to put a record. I, 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 we got a finance committee later, so I was, I was fine with that. Um, and so then I'll, I'll, it brings me to my last question, which is, okay, just for record, there's two buildings now. We want to expand it to the full five or full <coughs> village of five. Did I get that right? Yes, sir. All right. So, and this is to get us going, uh, get it constructed, and then the maintenance of it, uh, as far as utilities and so forth, is being covered how? Out of my existing budget. Out of your budget. Yes, sir. All right, so there's no obligation to us that we need to amend anything right now. So no, we sir. get it up and going, and we get sustained by the current operations of what we have in place. Is that and true? If it, and if I can be candid with you, Commissioner Robinson, until we <coughs> get going with this and figure out you know how, how many people and how you phase them in yep. and taking baby steps to put people in there and looking at what these split systems cost yep. it's going to take us a while to figure out what the ongoing utility i have some utility costs from gail woody from when the the, the buildings were previously used by her and animal control but i don't think that's going to be a good measure of what the actual cost is going to be okay and then just operationally, so again, I'm not a, a, a construction guy, but what the gray water? Is that what our existing system, I mean, you know, when I think about mobile homes, I think about, you know, where stuff is, the refuge or whatever. How does that work here? Is there any gray water matter? I mean, does it go into the, can one of you guys weigh in on that, Mark? What no, happens? Nothing I'm aware of. It just goes straight on through. <coughs> it all goes into the septic. Like a shower, like it, straight on into the septic, and we'll just maintain like it that way. All right, I got it. Are you? Okay. okay. Commissioner. I think that's what the field lines are for, mm -hmm. for the water and everything. But uh, <coughs> um, is this for the homeless or is this for the people from both, the accountability court? Both, both of which are homeless. Twenty percent of the people we bring into the court are homeless. And do you utilize the existing shelters that we have, like at uh, yes. like Fords and and the one on two capacity? Two capacity. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
When you originally came to us uh, before, did I thought you said that they were going to be the mobile homes were going to be moved by a local business here for free? Did you not say that? Uh, I hope that will be done, but it's, it can't be done because uh, it requires a technical proficiency and experience. And you have to just happen to have the tires that fit on mobile home axles and wheels. And you have to have the technical ability to split a mobile home in half mm -hmm. and put it back together. And so we looked at that possibility but it wasn't feasible because there's people that can hook up. Uh, Doug Coates was willing to do it for free, <coughs> but clueless about how to, how to do that kind of work. I mean, he can hook big stuff up and move it around, but splitting a mobile home in half, then putting it back together requires someone who's done it a lot. Well, uh, the people that's going to be staying there, are they going to be, well, they've got to go through classes? And yes. They got. They have to have a fine job? Yes. <coughs> How long can they stay there to where they can become independent of the government and, you know, free up the space for people just starting out? Our target is always six months. <coughs> it depends upon individual progress and, and our uh, attitude towards the participant. Now, if we bring people, one of the requirements that the entity has that is talking about giving us a triple match is that if the resident has a source of income, some people who live in the woods get a check. Now, if somebody lives in the woods, gets a check, then they're going to have to cough up some money to me to defray the cost of utilities. I'm not going to give them a free ride. Uh, but our target is generally six months, depending upon the progress of the participant. They'll be in drug treatment, individual and group treatment. They'll be in a curriculum we call moral reconnation therapy. They'll have basically the same requirements based upon their assessment that our normal participants have, with one exception. Their participation is totally voluntary. If they don't participate, then we'll kick them out. Bottom line, we're gonna give people a chance. I think that's more than fair. And if they don't wanna take that chance, then there's nothing more I can do for them. So we're gonna be giving them a hand up rather than a hand That's up. how I would put it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because there's a fine line there, you know, a lot of people are, uh, say, you know, they have to help themselves. And so we are requiring that they go to classes. We're requiring that they find work. And I assume you have a network of companies that hire people that um, may not have the best record. Uh, and are they hiring? Do you have a network of people, I do. <laughs> of companies that will hire people like I do. Okay. Um, right. I, I think some of my participants have done lots of things for people in this room and they just don't know it. But in addition to that, uh, we are working with the WIOA program and we are working with the uh, folks on Club Drive at the old 911 building with WorkSource Georgia to try to integrate our program into what they're doing. Okay. You're back. Okay. Commissioner Mitchell. <coughs> so, and this is, these are individuals versus families or, or individuals, right? So there's no, no. I mean, because I would like to see that and, and go by and deal with the, the homeless, as you know. Um, I, I see families sometimes versus just individuals. Well, I do see individuals, but so I, there's no workaround. There's no. I, other than sending these guys elsewhere to possibly pass it forward in other places, but is there is there such thing as a, am I reaching too far for a workaround to say if there was a uh, a, a dad and their son or somebody you know? But, you know the first response to homelessness. I've worked with homelessness for about twelve years. <coughs> the first response is always: is there a family member or a friend mm -hmm. who will take them in? Yeah. Uh, but frequently there is not. And sometimes uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, I, had a, I had a lady dropped off at the pantry one time 
to this drop drop said here and uh, she uh, had been in prison she got out of prison uh, was disconnected from her family and uh, she found uh, work at an elderly gentleman's house caretaking him and so she had a place to live mm -hmm. he died uh, the gentleman's family showed up said get out and they literally loaded her up in a vehicle and brought her to the pantry nobody there knew what to do they said Bo what do we do this woman's here she's homeless so I sat down and talked with her for a while and I found out that the reason she was homeless is because she was too embarrassed and too scared to call her family. So I called. <coughs> they came out, took her home. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it just takes someone to take an interest in someone else mm -hmm. to find a solution for them. Gotcha. But the first line of defense is always family and friends, and sometimes we'll buy somebody a bus ticket. If, if the, the family in Arkansas will take them, off they go. We'll buy them a bus ticket and head them to Arkansas. But other people, all their relationships are broken. They have no family, and, and maybe it may be their fault. Right, right. Absolutely. But the question then becomes, so do we just warehouse them in the woods or in the prisons? Right. Or do we try to do something different? Right. So uh, we spoke about the six months uh, time frame. Is that carbon, carbon stone, or is it, it could be six months per year or it could be I mean how we, we kind of gauge it by by the participants efforts mm -hmm. if they're sincerely doing everything they can do mm -hmm. if they're showing up for everything if they've got a good attitude mm -hmm. if they're really trying mm -hmm. we might extend it Understood. if they're not then it's not you're gone wow. and we need to move on to someone else who might be more willing to to help we, we found that people are appreciative of living in the housing we have, but nine out of ten of them, they want to have their own place and their own privacy. I agree. I agree. And they typically work towards it. They don't just say, well, I'll just stay here forever. Right. right. And that, that, we have not experienced that yet. Understood. And, and with the mental health side of it, um, medicine, the, the medication and all that good stuff, how are you guys kind of massaging that part of it to make sure that that's what they're doing because a lot of that is you know some mental health uh, or medicine that they're having to deal with that they can't seem to get access to or regulate and so on that is very very tough yeah. uh you know i've had some ongoing conversations with commissioner robinson and others mm -hmm. about the csb mm -hmm. and the struggles we've had there and we're hoping that's going to get better at it. But we do have a lot of people. Uh, right now, our only option for an indigent person who needs mental health uh, medicine is to send them to the CSB. And then we basically check with the participant because we just simply aren't able to get information out of the CSB right. on our participants, even though we have every waiver mm -hmm. you can think of. Mm -hmm. that They simply uh, so far have not interacted with us mm -hmm. in terms of how is this participant doing and that sort of thing. So we do pill counts sometimes when they start abusing their medication, for example, because we're testing these folks. So if you're on, uh, if you're on something for bipolar, mm -hmm. so we're testing you to make sure you're taking your medication, right. for example, but also to make sure your levels are not such that you're not abusing your medication, which sometimes they will do. Well, I, I must say, you know, I appreciate uh, this uh, task that you've taken on and took ownership of, and I think this is a, uh, a worthy task to take ownership of, and I, I commend you guys in, in doing such, uh, because it, it exists, and it's not going to go away by shoving it on the road or just up, up on the rug or just trying to sidestep it. It exists, and it's, and it's real, and uh, there's somebody out there that cares, and that still cares. Good. Well, when you start seeing people go from being homeless and their possessions consisting of a t-shirt, a pair of shorts, and a pair of flip-flops, mm -hmm. to working as a paralegal in a downtown law firm, Mr. Bernard, mm -hmm. and when you see that through your efforts, you get hooked. Yeah. You, you have to keep, keep doing it. Uh, one concluding point I'll make, because I know your time is precious, what's really interesting about this is we're going to be the first in the state 
nobody else is doing this. I've been corresponding with the folks at the council for accountability court judges trying to, well, hey, you know, teach me how to do this. If some other judge is doing this somewhere in the state of Georgia, I want to learn. <coughs> nobody is, we're going to be the first one. We're going to be the first homeless court in Georgia. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> thank you so much, uh, Judge. Thank, thank you, you so much. The staff and for your contribution as well. Y'all have a good day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Board of Commissioners, we covered number nine as well, so just want to make you aware. Um, next, we have the approval of the minutes. Just ask that the Board of Commissioners take a look at those minutes for tomorrow. Uh, we have a proclamation tomorrow also that will be read by the Girl Scout Troop of 316 Day, uh, which is the uh, Optimus uh, Club. Tomorrow they will be here reading a proclamation. So next we move to resolutions. Uh, tab number six, a resolution to adopt the Board of Education 2018 Millage Rate. Um, <coughs> Dr. Holman, do you have any comments for us? Um, yes, the Board of Education will adopt, I believe they're scheduled to adopt their millage rate um, this evening. Mm -hmm. And then um, tomorrow um, they will, or I will get the information from what they adopt tonight <coughs> and bring it for y'all. Um, because the law requires that the Board of Education, I mean the Board of Commissioners, uh, adopt the Board of Education's mm -hmm. millage rate. The Board of Education is a recommending authority, mm -hmm. whereas the Board of Educa uh, Commissioners is the levying, levying authority. Um, so along with that is, is number seven as well. Um, I'll be bringing the uh, resolution to adopt the Board of Commissioners 2018 millage rate as well. And I'll have a short presentation regarding the county's millage rate, pretty much like we had at the mid-year retreat, just scaled down. Okay. <coughs> All right, questions from the board, uh, Vice Chairman Ross. Yeah, I mean, millage rate is important. Um, we had a conversation at our retreat about giving, I think, what um, the city and the Board of Education are increasing their millage rate, and I think we were less than hours. Um, any more thoughts? And, and while it, it, it has merit to think about should the board, not could we, but should we um, try to be more balanced in that and trying to come in a, a broader fiscal policy that, that like, look, they are recommended. So <coughs> should we shape their increase down by offsetting it with what, hours? I mean, I, I really want to entertain that for a second. What, what do you guys think? Should we do that? Should we ever have a conversation where we, we come alongside um, these other jurisdictions and, and, and leave our power to be able to say, well, you know what, that's too much. Y'all are paying over there, you're paying over here, you're paying here. We're the highest governing authority at the local level, so should we do this to try to balance it all out? I mean, it, it was, um, it's something to consider. It is something to consider, Vice Chairman, but at this time, I, I, this is just my opinion. Our budget is not hip, uh, healthy enough to do it this time, but maybe a year from now, <coughs> um, things um, hit that digest, we may be in a better position to uh, offset some of those budgets, but today, my opinion is no. Uh, any other comments before I move? I would agree. Amen. <laughs> we got our oh, own plate to fill. <laughs> well, I just want to put that out there. I just, I'll, I'll, I'll yield the book. <coughs> no, it, it was, I yield up, Jay. It was more of us, because we would have to have a say over there in their pocket, and, and so I uh, we're going to take that kind of hit. And we're not there yet, but I yield. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll move to tab number eight, resolutions adopted a new process required by the Department of Revenue in which all 911 fees are to be collected and remitted back to local governments subject to final review. Uh, Director Whitaker. Good morning, Madam Chair, Board Members. Good morning. Um, House Bill 751 <coughs> was signed by the Governor uh, in May, passed into law. Uh, it did a lot of things for 911 in Georgia. One of the things it did was it created the Georgia Emergency Communications Authority and it also changes the way the 911 funds are going to be collected and remitted back to the local governments. Uh, effective uh, January 1, 2019, uh, the Department of Revenue will contract out with the Georgia Emergency Communications Authority uh, for the 911 revenues and if they will be remitted back to the, the counties or to the PSAPs, any one that operates the PSAPs, the CD or the government uh, PSAP operators. One of the things we have to do in order to be able to receive our 9-1 fees back uh, to the local governments is the uh, resolutions have to be signed in order to, to do this. And that's why I'm here to ask the board this morning to do 
Um, there, there's a prepaid and a pro postpaid uh, resolution that has to be uh, to the Department of Revenue by uh, September the uh, by September the 30th, 2018. So, um, in the meanwhile, we, we're able to send the Department of Revenue our current resolutions in order for the process to take place. We learned Friday at a uh, ACCG me meeting that. If November the, the 1st was the uh, deadline to get these resolutions in, the law says that the, the Department of Revenue has 120 days and that would not make the 120 days into January 1. So they backed it up that we were able to get our, our current resolutions in uh, on or before uh, August the 31st in order to get the process going. But um, in order to get our 9 feeds back, these resolutions <coughs> have to be in place uh, before November the 1st. Any questions on the board commission guide? Yes, Greg. Uh, how were they collected to begin with? Checks. <coughs> the, the, <coughs> the local exchange, the phone exchanges, and the wireless providers have been sending the checks directly to uh, the local governments. But for years, <coughs> the, 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 the local exchange carriers, the wireless providers, they've been trying to get centralized collections going. And if you remember a few years ago, they, they actually had the money is being collected and being sent straight into the state government uh, budget. Um, it's been going back and forth with uh, legislation for the past two years now between Georgia AFCO, Georgia NAN, and Georgia Island Directors Association to work with the wireless providers so that wouldn't happen. And when the governor, <coughs> after Senate Bill 222 was vetoed and the governor signed his executive order, basically the the it, it became a centralized collection issue and in order for it not to be able to go into the state budget and have to be appropriated back, the, the Georgia Emergency Communications Authority worked with the Department of Revenue, so this money is collected. It's like a sales tax now and sent back to the local governments. Well, in the sales tax, uh, they collect a Fee. Admin fee. <coughs> they're they're admin charging fee. Fees. Yeah. Does this have an admin fee <coughs> attached to it? The GECA is kind of <coughs> the DOR. I think it's a 1%. But there was other fees taken off after the, the wireless providers and the, the had decided to change their fees as well. But I think it's a total of three percent that they can charge is what the law says. But I don't. But they're not going to charge the. But I think one percent in the collection of remittances. I don't understand why ACCG let this pass. <laughs> one of the things that they got out of it was uh, in the, the negotiation. From what I understand, was the the. ACCG, along with the other Georgia associations, they wanted uh, cost recovery done away with, which is what we pay monthly to the wireless providers to provide phase two and phase, phase one and phase two wireless 9 service. That cost was originally put in place to pay for the infrastructure. The infrastructure has been paid for years ago. Mm -hmm. So we wanted that done away with. And we also wanted prepaid parity. Uh, prepaid parity takes the prepaid <coughs> fee up to $1.50. Currently, they were 75 cents. The reason for doing that was back in the day when everyone was redoing their or re adding minutes or whatever to their cards. It felt like a double dip, so that they only did 75 cents at the time. Well, now everything's monthly plans. So it, the 75 cents now goes to $1.50. So our prepaid money will double. So whatever we're getting in prepaid funds to, to Douglas County, that fee will actually double. And then whatever, whatever we're paying the the cost recovery that will go away, so we can use that money instead of paying the uh, the wireless providers for that service. Mm -hmm. So that was some of the compromises so that, that they came. So up. the offset where the state's going to charge us to collect. The yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's still going to come out with more money than he started with. Is it? Yes, ma'am. We pay the one seventy-five now versus what is it? One fifty versus seventy-five. Well, I just knew the state wouldn't do it yep. for nothing. That's great. <laughs> What are the phase one, phase two charges each month right now? Well, it depends. They all vary. Uh, some bill quarterly, some bill monthly. Um, it, it can be as much as uh, one provider is ten thousand dollars that, that we write a check out to when the bill comes. And so we don't have to pay that anymore. Yeah, that 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 will go away. Well, of course, we we'll have to budget money into next year because of the way the billing process works. We're, we get bills from the last year and into the next year. Well, I just know with sales tax, uh, the county's had trouble uh, with accountability as far as uh, the state. That's what they're sending us back is actually what was collected for the county. So uh, That's one reason that the Georgia Emergency <coughs> Communications Authority was established. It, it's one of the things they do is they oversight and they, they actually audit to make sure the process is happening and the funds are going to get back to the local government for the now one operation. 
and it's a local control board. There's mm -hmm. there's many uh, members on it from sheriffs, mm -hmm. commission chairs, mm -hmm. uh, county managers, uh, some state officials, because the, the authority is actually under the administrative control of GEMA and the Department of Homeland Security. I yield back. Okay. Any other questions before we move forward? Thank you, uh, Director Booker. Um, we've already hit, uh, touched upon nine. But, um, Judge McClain, we'll, we'll move to tab number 10, authorization to, to approve a car allowance agreement with Ames <coughs> Subhanny in the uh, District Attorney's Office and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Um, Madam Chair, we just, I don't think anybody's here from there. This is a replacement person, I understand, pursuant to Mark. So a car that is a person is leaving with a car allowance is okay. being replaced by a person who gets that car allowance, and this is that agreement. Okay. Any questions from the board? All right. Thank you. <laughs> we'll move to tab number 11, authorization to approve the Douglas County Safety Manual revision and update as recommended by the Safety Board. Director Laverne. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And um, I'm still on the men from medical uh, conditions, so I'll be sitting today if that's all right okay. with you. But I would like to present this. Um, and we're asking, um, I'm asking on behalf of the safety board for approval um, of this uh, revised and updated Douglas County Safety Manual. Uh, the purpose of this manual is to protect <coughs> Douglas County as an organization, to protect its insurability, um, to reduce or minimize its liabilities, and most importantly, to provide um, provide minimum safety standards for all of its employees. You know, most, if not all, departments have their own processes and procedures. And some even have their own policy manuals. But this safety manual will serve as a basis for minimum safety and procedural standards across the organization. Um, and it has also been designed to coexist with the other policy and safety manuals throughout the organization to include the fire department as well as the sheriff's department. Um, now this update is obviously different from our prior 1997 edition that only department directors and heads would receive. Um, and this is about three times in the prior, uh, three times the size of the prior version. But given the multitude of new business <coughs> units that uh, Douglas County BOC has in place, the number of tenants, the number of users of its assets, users of its facilities, vehicles, and other insurable uh, assets, it is a res it would be considered responsible of us, uh, just as other comparable organizations have done, put something this comprehensive in place to cover the organization as a whole. Um, I am recommending the approval of the manual on behalf of a unanimous vote from the safety board. Uh, last month, as well as myself as safety director. We've uh, made uh, multiple passes through this and continue to find um, ways to polish it, but all of its content and intent, um, as well as how it is going to flow, will all, um, will all come about as we provide course, or as I provide instructional classes on how the safety manual would be um, used. But this perfect mound book meaning that it's no longer in a three-ring binder, as well as its electronic version. We're not just born overnight. This has been a work in progress for several years now and was developed not just by my own hand, but also by benchmarking several of our neighbors and other local governments in our region as, as well as our state. From Cobb to Gwinnett to Henry and Rockdale counties, the safety manual is made up of the best practices from what we know works best here in Douglas, as well as these other areas, um, as well as with our neighbors and similar governments throughout the state of Georgia. But we didn't stop there either. Other best practices recommended by such agencies as the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, um, the, um, the Federal uh, Motor Carrier, uh, safety Administration, the FTA, the National Electric Code, as well as others have been integrated into uh, this, um, uh, this new draft um, of, um, and have been integrated into as compliance and or compliant procedures, I should say. But finally, we also distributed galley editing copies, uh, not only to this Board of Commissioners, 
but also to the safety board, to its elected officials, the, the county's elected officials, as well as 35 different department heads, managers, and supervisors. I received more than half of them, uh, half of the edits back with comments, suggestions, solutions, and other helpful inputs that allow this to flow and work best for the multitude of strategic business units that this Board of, Commissioner ha Board of Commissioners has in place. While all edits were extremely helpful, to include eight of my own, uh, former District Attorney Brian Fortner, former Fleet Manager Danny Egan, and Aubrey Reed of our Records Department provided uh, very comprehensive edits that were, that were very helpful. Um, others such as Chief Spencer, Chief Connor, Frederick Perry, as well as our workers' comp attorney Jim Johnson also provided very useful feedback as we went through these edits. Um, I also owe a special thanks to Lauren Kelly, um, who I was able to retain through the Board of Commissioners and ACCG's uh, intern program. Um, Lauren was an integral part in setting up the, uh, the manual organizing it and she proved herself to be very knowledgeable um, as an editing assistant, a talented researcher, as well as an effective writer. Uh, so as you can see, this work is not simply an update, but it's a revision that contains Douglas County's current policies, coupled with updated best practices and procedures, and a consensus that is generally accepted throughout the organization, as well as risk management and safety professions. Therefore, it is my recommend, recommendation that we approve it. Um, there are, a, a, we've, we found a few, a few other ways to polish it um, for the, uh, for the, before it goes out, but those are uh, just monitor uh, flow issues um, that, uh, that we have found, but uh, we'd like to continue moving forward, and we'd like to start off by getting this on Risk and Safety's website web page along with the 20 new 24 new fillable format uh, incident reports that'll make it a lot more efficient and easier for departments to report when incidents occur uh, in our operations so any questions any questions from the board, uh, board commissioners any comments uh, vice chairman Robinson. yeah i'll be quick i mean uh, dr bean i, I want to acknowledge that i mean obviously this is um, I, my words only of uh, a labor of love that you've been committed to this. I've, I've watched this evolve over time. Um, you, you stayed at this. I mean, there, there's certain, uh, as I call it, bodies of work that sometimes go unnoticed, unsung, and unappreciated. This is one of those where having codification of practices, codification of, of, of best practices for that matter, is important for our sustainability going forward. Um, there's a lot of institutional knowledge um, within Douglas County. Uh, you making sure that we have this um, deals with cost, deals with exposure. It's something that I can appreciate. So I just want to go on record and say thank you very much. I know what it took to sort of just be that diligent, that focused, that like, do y'all know how much um, you know, brain power they had to go into sort of pulling that all together and being committed to something that, that we should be proud of. So uh, thank you very much for that. Duly noted. I'm your Chair. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Director and also as a sitting commissioner on the safety committee, it is a pleasure to and an honor to just uh, have read the book, you know, because that was part of my assignment to make sure that it was right here. And I can tell you, I was highly impressed as I shared with you on the committee. So thank you for that great body of work. And uh, I know our citizens, and not only the citizens, but our employees are looking forward to this uh, great body of work being uh, advertised or placed on the website, which it will be on the website as well, and also hard copies. So thank you. Thank All you. right, we'll move to tab number 12, authorization to apply for three different right-of-way easements for the construction of radio towers in the 2016 SLOST uh, public safety radio system uh, project and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Chief <coughs> good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> as uh, Mr. Nix talked about earlier with our radio system, uh, we're getting ready to actually start building towers. We've already poured the uh, footings at Fire Station 5, which is Chapel Hill. Uh, but we've got to get power to those towers as well. So these are the easements that we need to get power to those towers. Uh, Greystone needs that easement agreement, and that's that's what these are for uh, Fire Station 8, which is Mirror Lake, the Bell Arc uh, Park Tower, which is out on Highway 5, and then our Fire Station 5 Tower on Chapel Hill. 
Okay. Any questions from the board? Thank you, Chief. <coughs> Thank you so much. All right, authorization 12, I mean, <coughs> number 13, uh, tab number 13, authorization to accept a check from the Sheriff's Office scope account in the amount of $286.78 for candy given out the 4th of July parade. Um, Major Holmes. Yeah, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, in case anybody doesn't know, the scope is our community outreach uh, division. It's, it's uh, Sheriff's Community Outreach Programs and Education, and uh, that's what that check was, was for. Thank you so much. Any questions from the board? I'll move on to the next one. Uh, tab number 14, authorization to accept a check from the Sheriff's Office <coughs> scope account in the amount of $49.80 for the food purchases for the scope program. Major Holmes. Yeah, that back, uh, if y'all remember, over the summer, we did a kids uh, law enforcement academy in conjunction with Dolorica, mm -hmm. and this was for a meal that uh, was done during that week for that. Anything? Anything from the board of commissioners? Thank you so much, uh, mm -hmm. Major Holmes. Tab number 15, authorization to award a contract to Carter Watkins Associates for architectural <coughs> services to design the Deer Lick Park restroom facility and tennis courts to be funded through the 2016 SPLOS funds and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Uh, Director Dukes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, ma'am, we're uh, recommending Carter Watkins. They were below bid to design the tennis courts and restroom <coughs> at uh, Deerlick, and that comes as a recommendation from the Recreation Oversight Committee. Okay. Thank you. You said below bid? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, Commissioner Mulkin. Yeah. Right. You, you never can't argue with the, with the low bid. Uh, no discussion about that, but this is a, a uh, corporation that has done good work for Douglas County in the past. We have a good experience with them, good working rapport with them and our, and our staff. Previously, they did work for the animal shelter and the government annex building. So and I think everyone's pleased with those two projects and we expect the uh, same type of work. Okay. Thank you. Are you okay? Okay. All right. We'll move on to the next tab, <coughs> tab number 16. I think we've got a table, that, correct? We'll, um, we'll just move it to the next agenda. To the next agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we look forward to hearing from you on the next agenda, our director Peacock. Okay, next we have tab number 17, authorization to negotiate with Transitions Commute Solutions, LLL. Is that LLL or LLC? LLC. Yeah. Okay, LLC. To be the third party operator of Douglas County's fixed route shuttle system. Shuttle system. Director Watson. Hey everyone. Back last fall, we started the process of identifying transportation providers who might be interested in operating our fixed route uh, bus service. Uh, with the assistance of uh, Mr. Peacock and his purchasing department, we issued a request for qualifications through our, our standard policies and procedures. And we also identified about seven companies that we knew uh, who operate bus services throughout different communities so we issued the request for qualifications we got four submittals back uh, we invited all four of the companies that uh, issued submittals to us to come to douglas county for face-to-face -face interviews uh, one cup co one company declined we had another company who was running very late on the day of the interviews and it was the decision of the um, uh, evaluation committee not to allow them to reschedule uh, their uh, <coughs> uh, proposal submission. So we actually ended up uh, interviewing two companies. Uh, and out of those two interviews, uh, we, we selected uh, Transition Commute Solutions as the, the company that we would choose to negotiate uh, to operate our fixed uh, route bus service with. And today we have Justin Rising, who is CEO of Transition Commute Solutions with us. And Justin's going to come up and tell you a little bit about himself and his company. Thank you so much, Director Watson. Thank you, Mr. Rising. Good morning. Good morning. Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioners. I was under the air conditioning, so I'm still kind of thawed a little bit. Long, so <laughs> 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 the point of, of who we are, and honestly, today was fantastic because obviously you have a lot of great things going on in your community right now. And the one thing that this is going to bring is connectivity. Uh, connect connectivity is a big part, not just for your current 
items and agendas and employment and, and elements in your community that you want to touch, but also for the things that you want to do going forward. And so that's what we're talking about here is really connectivity throughout your community. Uh, what do we do? Uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about is building blocks for tomorrow. That's really what we're going to do with your fixed route program. Looking at that program, a lot of the heavy lifting starts with us getting out on site long before those vehicles are put on the ground. We want to make sure that routes are safe, they're secure, that people can walk to them safely. When you're talking about things like lighting structures and facilities and infrastructure, a lot of that is started before you begin with those routes. What community are you trying to serve? Where are you trying to connect people to? So a lot of things that we'll be doing even before the first vehicle gets on the road, before the first passenger is picked up, is ensuring that when you're getting to those locations, you're safe and secure, both getting there and, and at the end of the day. Uh, program development and continued improvement. <coughs> transportation is a living, breathing piece of our community. You know, some places that don't do very well with transit are those locations that set up a one-time shop and that's it, they never go back to it. But transportation <coughs> is seasonal. It, it can move it and ebb and flow based on occup occup occupancies of people that want to ride, if you build new sectors, if you build new housing facilities, you want to look and try and connect those places. Uh, if your community changes, if it flows from, from one side to another over weeks or months or years, you want to make sure that you adapt to that as well. Community outreach. This is very important for us because we want to make sure that all players come to the table to put in their input as to what their needs may be. Uh, a lot of the times we can sit in a room and talk about what those needs are but then we set up a system that doesn't meet the time structures or the needs for employment or for schools or things of that nature. Uh, commuter and driver programs. This is big because you already have a great system that works with employers today. So you want to make sure if there's connectivity to your shuttles or to your van pool locations, your parking rides, that we are, are connecting those so that they're not separate functions in your community but can all integrate together. New adaptive routes, route structures, technology. This is big because right now we're in a, in, in a situation where we have a population of commuters that still want to get online or, or even just dial a phone number and talk to somebody. That's something that we'll bring to the table. But then you also have a millennial group that's coming to the table right now that, that likes the technology on hand. And one of the things that we're going to do is adapt both of those together so that somebody can pick up a phone and make a phone call to find out where a, a route may be or get online and see where that vehicle might be themselves. Um, and that's to ensure that, that everybody can be reached, no matter what type of sources they're using. We consider ourselves a, a, a small company, uh, but we also have a passion and a partnership for, for the community around us. What this means basically is that we know everybody that we work with. Um, as far as myself, I'll be here during the developmental stages as well as all my partners uh, throughout it. There's never a project that we, we stay away from. <coughs> We're working together with this community to be successful, uh, to create the best routes and structures. Uh, routinely, we work with veterans groups, with Department of Labor groups, to make sure that we are, we are reaching to people in the community that might be, uh, have long-term unemployment or recently getting out of, of situations of, of military or resources that we can put back into resources helping us. And we find this very successful for us when we start talking about our drivers in the community base. Um, as far as what we do, uh, in the state of Georgia right now, we operate in 18 different counties uh, with, within the state. We've been doing this since uh, 2012. Uh, we currently operate about 400,000 trips a year throughout the state of Georgia. Uh, I personally work with the Georgia Transit Association. I'm on the board as well as the current treasurer for Georgia Transit Association. So we're very connected with GDOT and the different resources that, that move people around. Uh, we've recently launched the Carroll County program. Now that's more of a paratransit program, but that, was, that took us about two and a half years to get that program up and running. Uh, and that's slowly growing, but it's, it's a great resource. So we're very familiar with building new programs within the state of Georgia. As far as fixed routes, we work with fixed routes uh, in the Three Rivers Regional Commission, which is just a little bit south of you, as well as along the coast of Georgia. Uh, we're very familiar with working with employer-based programs, uh, with programs that get people to work. In, uh, also to tourist locations, a lot of times out on the coastline you see that, and we see that even already in, in your type of structure here, where you, you cross over a lot of areas that are both seasonal but long term as well. Uh, FTA, DOT, one of the things that we bring to the table is already our current knowledge of reporting structures for you. So you're not going to have to really teach us, we're going to show you the way about how to work with the FTA, with DOT, for your, your reporting of ridership to make sure that your federal funding comes back. 
as, as I've talked with Gary uh, through this, you have a grant to get started, but down the road we've got to move that into a longer term process, and that's through the collection of ridership data. So we're going to be there from day one to make sure that those dollars and miles are collected, uh, so this pays for itself as we go down the road. <coughs> what makes us different than everybody else? Uh, honestly, I believe it's, it starts with our professionalism. We make sure from day one that everybody that works for our company is our company. Uh, when it comes to transportation needs out there, there's a lot of different resources, but we want to make sure that the best foot is always put forward for our drivers. So our drivers are well trained through pass certifications, offensive drivers, CPR. Uh, we want to make sure that your commuters, our commuters, our community that rides our buses always have a safe driver behind the wheel of that vehicle and we know who that individual is. Uh, we're looking for ways to improve that through driver retention programs. Uh, we're looking at ways to always ensure that the community is safe. Uh, you know, there, there are so many programs out there where people can, can dial up a, an application and you're not sure what type of vehicle you're getting behind. You're not sure who the driver might be. That's not the business we're in. The business we're in is making sure that our community is always safe when they're entrusting in our public transit systems. The other thing that we want is a, a good professional driver that's going to be in uniform for you uh, and that what you put out as the product that you decide upon at, at the final stage is the, the marketing, the branding, is one that people can have reliability and then have trust in. Trans transportation is only as good as you being on time as us being on time and providing that service in a safe and efficient manner and that's what we're going to do for this community is make sure it happens. Uh, and one thing that I will, Gary did mention to me the other day is make sure that we, we talk about the budget. Uh, and while I don't have a slide for it, I will tell you this. We have looked over the budget, and I know there's always a lot of budget concerns with diff different things and, and, and throughout the year, but from what we see right now is that our budget is in line with what the recommendations are. So we believe that we can go to the market today uh, and start this process off well within the budgets that we have in place. I think the budget was well done. Uh, obviously, Gary and his team has put a lot of time into making sure that these routes, at least preliminary, uh, have a good costing mechanism to that. And by looking at the hours and the staff, not only will we be within budget, but what we will offer the employees here in the community will be a well-paid job with full-time benefits uh, and leave another availabilities um, that really is a, is a great benefit for the community. This is again just a final thought for you guys as you're making this last determination as who we are in the community. Uh, we all enjoy our time in the space that we spend in Georgia. Uh, Georgia is a unique transit environment, <clears throat> excuse me, because a lot of times the funding doesn't really begin and end at the state level. And luckily for us, through the grants that we have in place right now, uh, a lot of this is coming down from FTA to start with and we're able to use that spend, but that money that, that begins that spend will be spent in the community locally, uh, and because of our experience in the state of Georgia, we'll be able to provide that understanding of what is needed to integrate uh, a program from a federal program to one that works within your community and the costs are contained within that operational process. Uh, it's, uh, Georgia is a different transportation state, uh, and, and by working in, in the history that we have here, we bring a lot of working knowledge to you in this community. Um, Lastly, we are a consolidated management process. Uh, what this means for you is that a lot of the things that, that we are going to offer in your program, in your community, uh, there'll be a, a operational hub that's stationed here. Obviously, you already have a transportation location in place that we'll work out of. But a lot of what we do is to minimize costs as a whole. Uh, so we want to make sure that you have the best product, but the most cost efficient product. So we'll have a call, consolidated call center. Uh, it currently services 18 counties in the state of Georgia. Uh, we will use those same resources to adapt uh, into this operation. What that means is it's going to be a lot less expensive for you, and it will be operational a lot quicker. Uh, <laughs> the cost will be shared, but it will still allow you to have a unique phone system so that when somebody calls whatever uh, phone number you want to have set up, it will be answered with a nomenclature that you want to greet your community, uh, and it will allow us to have a, a much larger overlap for a lot less uh, expense in that process. Um, our human resources, our drug and alcohol management, our financial management are all, are, are all consolidated programs that again allows us not to need four or five different people but share those resources to keep your costs down. And that's just how we have to build smart growth in transportation as a whole. Uh, our communities only need more transportation as we go forward. Our, our community is, is aging, our younger populations uh, are looking more toward public transit as they move forward 
And both of those things have to be met by us being smart fiscally with what we have. We have to augment data and technology into our populations, but also make sure that we can communicate with the populations that don't necessarily use those. And those are all the things that we're going to bring to the table uh, as we move forward. So I'm excited for this journey. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, my throat is still coming back from the air conditioning. Uh, but uh, okay. this, I know this has been a long term coming for, for, for a lot of you. Uh, and really, this is exciting for us because the journey of starting a public transit program uh, is, is a great time, and I think it'll be well received by your community once it's up and running. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Wilson? Uh, Commissioner Robinson? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. Um, um, it, it is acknowledged that, um, uh, and, and Gary, our committee, uh, Transportation Committee, did um, convene and make a recommendation for this to the full board. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And, and so, with that being said, there's a couple questions I have, and this is just me strictly for, for my position, not on behalf of the full committee. And, and this is to um, uh, our provider. So, you mentioned something about budget, and I, I want to make sure that it's not dismissed in, in the commentary but there's a need to provide a more detailed level budget. Um, are you going to be able to provide that for us? Because part of this, before you respond, our approach um, has to be one of, of sort of transparency. Um, and one of the things we, we, we learned through this initial process, but also going forward, and especially when you talked about being part of this implementation phase, you know, before the first rider, is we've got to be able to communicate to the public about how we're pro our approach not that it just shows up and it's a big bang theory. So it, it's more of a, can you speak to how you would help us communicate that? Or, or Gary or whomever? Oh, let me take this. I think so. that. Yeah, absolutely. Where we start with this is really there's been some background work done on, on as far as suggestions of what those routes are going to look like. You know, when we start this process, we want to go and make sure those routes are accurate. You know, a lot of times those routes are done from a, uh, a computer-based process in a desk somewhere that's not on the, on the ground. And that's where we come into play. So we've got to put boots on the ground to, to run those routes, to, to get in a vehicle, and then walk those routes. So I think that's where it starts. Uh, Budget-wise, we can build a budget off of those. And as long as we ebb and flow in those same time frames, then it really doesn't matter as far as the time and the miles that take place. When you're talking about a 16-hour uh, shift uh, throughout a day, that budget doesn't really change uh, because the miles in the mile per hour stay pr fairly consistent uh, throughout the day. So I guess the operational approach of what you're going to market to the people uh, and, and then the actual operational budget uh, really are two different things. But as long as that the operational hours and time stay within what was projected, there really is no increase. Just put a pin on that one. I'm gonna, we're going to need some more detail beyond that. That I appreciate the answer, but I, I, we're going to have to go a little bit deeper. All right. My, my next question is, is more about, um, and we've had this conversation. Just for the, for the record, I was not part of the original presentation um, that was made um, to the transportation committee. I had eye surgery that day and I was out. So, but I did have a subsequent um, conversation at the recommendation of my vice chair. Uh, to speak with you guys, and so I did, and so I want to make sure I go up record of that in case somebody go back and look at the tape and say I wasn't there. Of course I wasn't there. All right, so that being said, uh, I asked you a question about what happens when things go wrong. It's great that we got the routes moving, we're on time, we're within reason, there's service level de um, delivery, but, but life happens. And so what happens when um, something happens behavior-wise on the bus? And we had this conversation, but I need you to speak to this on record. How do we handle that? What, what well, first that we start, start by, by having great training in place already with our drivers. So our drivers have industry-leading training in place before they start driving their very first day. Uh, pass training, which is a passenger sensitivity training, is typically a three-day class that they're a part of. Defensive driver training is an additional two-day class that they're a part of. Um, so that's where it begins. Plus, we have our own job orientation process. It's a full day that goes through all the things that maybe weren't fully uh, added in those, in those training classes. But from there, uh, all, all of our vehicles will be equipped with tablets as well as, as phones um, that will speak to uh, our communication with our call center. Where we're different than a lot of places is that we have a dedicated call center. Uh, and what that means is that our drivers always have access to somebody that their whole job is to receive information and data from our drivers. They're not trying to uh, make sure that other things are needed throughout the day. They're not looking about scheduling staff. They're, they're dedicated to the needs of the drivers and the commuters. Uh, so by doing that, 
we have processes in place that make it real quick for our drivers when there's an emergency to get a hold of our call center. And then from there, our call center becomes the next point of contact. And we'll create a, a response tree, if you will, um, that will allow the call center to identify the local manager, to identify the police department, to identify first aid, whatever the case may be through that call center. But it's a centralized hub that when that, that individual acts up or speaks up, uh, responses aren't in minutes, they're in seconds. As soon as that driver sends out the information, even to the point where we can build in an app right into the program that with the touch of one button on the tablet allows the driver to identify the call center of who they are, that their emergency is taking place. Because uh, we, we have that. I mean, you're right, life does happen. Um, not necessarily uh, an assaultive behavior, but we've had heart attacks, we've had strokes, we've had diabetic seizures on our buses, uh, and our drivers are trained to handle those emergencies. Let me tell you what you get to a comment. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah, let me uh, drill down just a little bit on this, uh, what I call real-time rider connectivity uh, through your app application, your app. And uh, I've experienced this in, in, in other places in the world. And if, so we have an, say we have an incident, a bridge is down or, or, or blocked or whatever, and you, and you have to re uh, realign your route or reroute. Uh, uh, first of all, is that information some way convey to a rider who may pull up on pull your your uh, system up on their smartphone or, or whatever is that information does that go out to the customer to your rider yes sir the some no we're not going to pick up at these two stations <coughs> because right. the bridge is down yes sir so what we have is we've introduced several different technologies that we haven't fully decided upon yet that's going to be something that's in the procurement process uh, but there's a half dozen out there and it's more of an accordion process is, is what we refer to it as, is that when buses bunch up or through rerouting or through, uh, maybe it was just simply you had somebody that got on a bus that was in a wheelchair and it took an extra seven or eight minutes to load them up versus a walk-on passenger. Those talk to themselves and those can also report real time uh, back to an application feature. So any routing mechanisms that take place, even at the point that <coughs> something changes. I was driving up here today and there was some filming going on. So I was rerouted uh, through my GPS. We can push those routes real time back onto a computer-based system if that's what the community chooses to do so that people always know where that vehicle is and knows what that drop-off and pickup point is. Okay, uh, that, that answers my question. And to just to elaborate a bit more than uh, if I'm going, uh, I, I need to I'd go to a particular place, so the app will tell me where to go to the, to the stop. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, and then while I'm at the stop, I can call up real-time information. Well, the uh, uh, the van is running seven minutes late. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, very it, good. Or better than yet, it'll just say it'll be here in six and a half minutes. Very good. Okay. Uh, the last question uh, is uh, your hiring practices. Uh, what focus will be on on hiring Douglas County citizens that are qualified to operate your routes, drive your routes? All. Yeah, we, we always hire locally. That's that's our commitment to the community. Uh, so even even our manager base, we will look to hire here locally. Um, obviously, we, we have consolidated systems that, that will be outside of Douglas, uh, and the call center is, is on the coast of Georgia. I understand. But, but as far as management, as far as drivers, uh, safety team, uh, lead drivers, everything starts from here. Uh, our, we are a promote within company, uh, but we also hire locally when we start. Okay. Um, and so when our, our drivers potentially will become our managers, I can point to every single operation we have right now that our, our local managers started as drivers. Right. Uh, because it's a it's a complicated business and, and really we believe in it it's a driver first mentality because without our drivers we can't be successful very good and uh, we'll check you on that please mm -hmm. I yield back okay. <clears throat> okay any other questions before we move forward thank you so much mr thank you very much justin uh, director are you finished yeah. you, you've done okay <clears throat> thank you so much we'll move on to the next tab tab is tab number 18 <laughs> authorization to accept reimbur reimbursement funds from FEMA, but uh, expenditures uh, inc incurred from Hurricane Irma disaster uh, declaration DR 4338 in the total amount of state and federal bonds of $13,920.06 and amend the budget. Director Mulholland, how are you? Yeah. Uh, we may also want to add on to sign the document. There's a packet of documents that we have to sign to send back to uh, Georgia Emergency Management and FEMA. Okay. Uh, but uh, this basically just wrote, uh, and this declaration was a little bit different than most of them. Most of the time you have to be, we have to be around uh, close to half a million dollars before we get any reimbursement. And this was a um, kind of unusual event where the uh, the president signed a declaration pre-landfall pre and declared every 
county in the um, state of Georgia for a category in category, or A and B. So I was able to go back and recoup some of the costs that the county spent preparing for that event, even though we did have, um, didn't have that much damage in the county, but we did have some expenses. And I was, this was what I was able to come up with. The first offer they came back with was like 4000 I went back and had them go back and go re-look re at the numbers, and I was able to get up to this. And this is close. This is how I can <coughs> I've been able to get it up the last <coughs> eight months or whatever. Wow. Any questions for Director Holloway? Very good. Thank you so much. Um, next to tab 19 through 23, that's just the approval of our expenses tomorrow, commissioners, and we'll take a look at those and approve them accordingly <coughs> tomorrow. Um, with that being said, any other comments from the Board of Commissioners before I call for executive session? Commissioner Rocks. Yeah, just real quick, just for the record, um, we've got a finance committee today at 2 p.m. Um, Director Holman, what's on our agenda today? The, it's a very short agenda, approval of the minutes, and um, the July finance committee report okay. as Thank of July 31st. You. Thank you. And uh, Director Valentin, we've got a transportation committee tomorrow at 2 p.m. Can you, for the record, tell everybody what's on the agenda? Yes, sir. There's several items uh, related to project updates. Uh, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about the acquisition of uh, uh, easements and uh, right-of-way. And uh, we also have the project on uh, the sidewalk project, the widening project combination on Chapel Hill Road. We're going to have to make some decisions related to uh, setting the scope of that project so that you're not All right. Anything else? Okay. Right. You'll there. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, at this time, uh, Attorney Bernard, uh, do we need to go into executive session? We do, Madam Chair, for litigation and real estate. Okay. Board of Commissioners, do I have a motion? To, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So, so second. Okay. We have a motion to second. All in favor say aye. Aye. <coughs> okay, take a 10 minute break yes. and we'll see you right back in here. Please launch yourself right. Launch yourself. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're back. Um, before I ask the commissioners if they have any other comments or discussion, I would like to commend Commissioner uh, Mitchell for uh, bringing us into the 21st century, him and his programming team or committee. <laughs> and we have a red light now that tells us which way to go. So I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell, for those efforts. Uh, any comments from the Board of Commissioners? Um, with that being no, I said, I guess this meeting is adjourned. This meeting is adjourned.